Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Amanda. As a student at the Department of Aquatic Resources, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science at Uniponegoro University, it's a precious change for me to be your host in this very special occasion. First of all, let's pray and praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because of His bless and mercy. We can join this together without any obstacle and in healthy condition in the world class professor with the topic Married Invertebrates Series 2. Let's greet and pray to our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who has brought us to the path of light. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Dr. Agus Trianto. SDMSC as the vice, vice Dean of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, Diponegoro University. The Honorable Dr. Suryanti MPI as the Head of Aquatic Resources Department. The Honorable Associate Professor Kenneth London, PhD from the from University of Gothenburg and Natural History Museum, Sweden as our keynote speakers. The Honorable Dr. Mizan Ardanu Asagabaldan, SPIMSI, as our speakers. The Honorable Dr. Dia Ayuningrum, SPGMSI, as our speakers. The Honorable Dr. Aninditya Sabdaningsi, SSIMSI, as the moderator for today. And welcome to all of the participants. Ladies and gentlemen, before we come to the main session, let's start this event by praying first, so it will run well without any obstacle. Pray based on individual belief begins. Finish. Now, let me deliver the structure for the event for today as follows. First, opening by host, Second, hearing the national song. Third, the speech from the Vice Dean of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science. Fourth, presentation and discussion about biology of metazoa part two, annelids, crustaceans, and, ech and echinoderms. Fifth, bryozoan from Java Sea, the potential of marine biodiversity in Indonesia. Six, presentation and discussion about tunicates in Indonesia waters and its associate bacteria. Seven, discussion and closing. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will step to the next agenda. I would like to invite all of us to sit properly and hear Indonesia Raya, the national anthem of Indonesia.
Thank you. Move on to the next agenda. We would like to invite Dr. August Trianto as the Vice Dean of Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science to give the warm speech. To Dr. August Trianto, time and screen are yours. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Uh, good uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is my great honor to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, what is it, guys lecture uh, on marine invertebrates series. First of all, thanks to Associate Professor Kenneth Landin, PhD of University of Gothenburg and Gothenburg Natural History Museum, Sweden. And also our thanks to Dr. Mizan uh, as a Gabaldan of a uh, study program of marine and fertile science, ITERA. And uh, to Dr. Resi Christiana of Merrill Foundation Indonesia, and also to Dr. Dia Ayuningrum of Department of Aquatic Resources, University of Diponegoro, and also our thanks to moderator, Dr. Anindita Sabtaningsi. Okay, uh, this uh, evening uh, is my great pleasure to again welcoming of you uh, and also on the behalf or of our dean, Professor Trinaria Agustini, who cannot uh, attend this meeting due to another or this activity. Uh, I hope uh, by uh, this uh, guest lecture, all of us can share our knowledge, especially from uh, Dr. Uh, Kenneth London and also for other speakers. We can learn about uh, marine debates in Indonesia and their importance because uh, everybody knows if Indonesia is one of the richest country in marine biodiversity. So hopefully by understanding the uh, marine interpreters, we can what is, uh, understand. We can understand the role of uh, every interpreter and also their potency uh, for a uh, human being. I think uh, for me is uh, me enough. Uh, again, thank all of you guys, all of you participants for attending this meeting and apologize uh, if uh, we cannot welcoming you uh, what is, as one as uh, you expected. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And what is, so uh, I think it's enough for me. Uh, moderator, do I need to open uh, this uh, system? Yes, please. Okay. Open and closing maybe. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you for the chance. Uh, okay. Uh, in the name of uh, our God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so I open uh, this case lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. August Trianto for the warm speech. So before we start the guest lecture, we will have a photo session. So please everyone to uh, open your camera and give your best smile to the photo for this photo session. Okay. 
uh, to all the participants, uh, please open your camera for this photo session and give your gorgeous smile. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for the comedy, uh, please uh, take the picture. Could you please take the picture? Uh, maybe Mr. Koko. Uh, I want to take a picture uh, in uh, counting three. One, two, three. And next slide. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuko. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now we move to the main point of the event, which will be led by Dr. Aninditya Sabdaningsi, SSI MSI, as the moderator. To Dr. Aninditya Sabdaningsi, time and screen are yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Good yeah, evening. Yeah. <laughs> the Honorable, the Vice Dean uh, of Faculty Fisheries and Marine Science Universitas Diponegoro, Dr. Agus Prianto, MSCPSC, the Honorable, the Head of Aquatic Resources Management, Dr. Suryanti. Maybe uh, she cannot attend this event. And also uh, the distinguished keynote speaker from University of Gothenburg, Sweden, and also uh, from Gothenburg Natural History Museum, Associate Professor Kenneth Lundin, PhD. Respectable all speaker for this lecture, Dr. Mizan Asada Belden, and then Dr. Deha Yuningum and Dr. Resi Christiana and all of participants who attend this event welcome to our guest lecture for the second series yeah maybe for the participant in the previous uh, series welcome back this is our second meeting or maybe several meeting if you are my student so this case lecture is one of the world class professor program that's sponsored by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, Republic Indonesia, collaboration with LPDP, Indonesian Endowment Fund for Education. So this is this even also support the sustainable goals development or we used to know SDGs, SDG series, uh, for quality education, and then life below water, and also partnership for the course. Uh, from the first series, we have learned about the lower of Metazoa, delivered by Dr. Kenneth Landin. And also no difference here yeah, from Dr. Resi Christiana. In the second series, we will learn another beautiful creature from the sea, uh, like analyte and then crustacean, echinoderm, bryozoa, and also tunicate. Okay, so for today, we have three lectures come from different institutions and uh, maybe uh, today we will have panel sessions so I will invite three speakers in one moment and then they will deliver their presentation first after that we can continue with the discussion so maybe uh, before we start I will introduce you to our beloved lecturers or speakers. So please, uh, the committee, you can 
share the curriculum vitae. Okay. Norman, the first speaker first, please. Yeah, I uh, will introduce you to the keynote speaker, our keynote speakers today. We have special guests from Sweden. He is Associate Professor Kenneth London PhD, and he is a lecturer from the Department of Marine Science, also senior curator from the, the wait, Natural History Gardenberg Museum, yeah. And he has educational background in chemistry, math, and ecology at Lund University for undergraduate, and he continued to study biology at Gutenberg University for master program, and he received his doctor from Gutenberg University. He experts in marine invertebrates, and he interests his his interest uh, in marine invertebrates as well, like Lady Helmintes, Vivantia, and many more. If you want to discuss with him, you can contact him by his email in kinetlundin at fijiregion.sa. Yeah, and then. You also can follow him uh, from his research case account to read his publications. Okay, so then the second lecture, please. We have special guest from ITERA, Institute Technology Sumatra. He is Dr. Medan Ardanu Asadabal and SPEMSI. He finished his undergraduate program from Department of Aquaculture, Gajah Mada University, Jakarta. Then he holds Master Science, also Doctor from Coastal Resource Management, Department of Aquatic Resource, Universitas Diponegoro. He loves to find new bryozoa and do research in marine microbiology. Then you can reach him by email at nathan.asagabaldan.sll.itera.ac.feid.id and then the last speaker or lecture we have please please move to the next slide okay we have dr dia ayuningrum from Undip is a lecturer at the Department of Aquatic Research. And then his, her educational background, he, she finished a undergraduate program from Department of Biology, Universitas Negeri Semarang, Indonesia. And also like Dr. Mizan and me, she finished her Master and Doctoral Program from this department, Department of Aquatic Resource. And she exports into Nikit and love to work in microbiology. Then you can also contact her at bihayuningrum21 at lecture.undip.su.id. So, okay, please welcome. Our beloved lecturers, are you there? Yes. Three of you, how are you? I, yeah, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Meizan, Dr. Meizan. Hey, hey. Is, how are you? I'm fine. From Sumatra, Good. yeah? From Sumatra. Yes. This were in land from, from Java. Java, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and Dr. Dia. Hi, Dr. Ranin. How, how was your day? Um, 
good, I'm feeling good. Uh, a bit okay. nervous. <laughs> a bit nervous. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, because we have a panel sessions, uh, after Dr. Kenneth uh, deliver his talk, then please Dr. Maiden will continue. After that, okay. uh, the last the last lectures will be delivered by Dr. Kia. Uh, okay. For the first, okay, for the first uh, opportunity, I will invite Dr. Kenneth Lundin to deliver your presentation. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Ranin, and mm -hmm. let me say I'm very, very grateful to be to have this opportunity to to uh, give this lecture for you yeah. uh, from from Scandinavia. Um, this gives me an opportunity to wear my nudibranch hat uh, when it, whenever it's really serious things going on. Yes, uh, that's very good, very nice, <laughs> Mr. Kenneth. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you like it. Um, uh, in Sweden, up in Northern Europe, in, in Scandinavia, uh, we have five big universities. We have uh, four marine stations, uh, two on the West Coast, um, because that is salty water close to the North Sea. And then we have two marine stations in the Baltic Sea to, on, on the east side. The Baltic Sea is the largest brackish water sea in the world, so it has very special ecological. Uh, oh, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of special species there, it's a very vulnerable area, area. But we have more species, more nudibranchs on the west coast where I work, but I also work on the uh, all kinds of nudie and all kinds of uh, other invertebrates. But I know that some of these. Um, marine station, especially the one that is closest to, to the, my hometown of Gothenburg, uh, the, the marine station of Kristineberg, that's been running uh, for 150 years. You can apply for funds uh, as a foreign student, a foreign researcher to do your research at the marine station there. And they have that every year, the Lovian money, the funds. So you can contact me and I can put you in contact with those responsible for that, even if you want to look into that. So, okay, uh, you remember the last time we were talking about the, the, the group Metasoans, that's us, the, the, the multicellular animals, the heterotrophic, we uh, cannot photosynthesize, high. we cannot get uh, food from the sun, so we must move around and get foods from either other animals or plants. So that set us on the path to develop all these abilities. Um, so now I will continue further exploring uh, the metasoa. Oh, can you see this? Okay. Yes, we Dr. Can. Anin, you can see it, very good. Yes, so it's, good. my talk is the biology of the metasoa part two, and then we look into the annelids, the crustaceans, and the echinoderms. And the photos here is mostly by uh, my friend and colleague, Klaus Malmberg. Uh, who, and both of us has been involved in the, the Mero um, research station at Tulamben and Bali. So, uh, if we, oh, I should be able to get the next slide. Okay, uh, if you recall, this is uh, an evolutionary tree uh, of uh, some multicellular organisms. Uh, you have fungi on the side. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are actually not so far related, we are a bit related to fungi, much more than we are to salad and, 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 and algae actually. Uh, and then you have the quanoflagellates, and then you have the metasoans, uh, that's us animals, multicellular organisms. And the most basal group is the porifera, 
the sponges and we were touching into the cnidarians uh, that is the anemones and corals uh, with the uh, radial symmetry because they are sedentary they are filtering food or catching food that's passing by or just drifting in the water and then we uh, we're talking about the acelomorph or seen acelomorphs, the, the first animals uh, that was moving, crawling uh, with some speed um, and had this two-sided symmetry, two sides like us, that is, this is mirror images because you, knew, you need that to be able to move in a straight line <laughs> if you're not a sea star. But I'll come back to the sea stars later. But also when you're moving, um, that's where you meet the, the senses. If you, you're gonna chase some food, uh, of course there will be a, a selection for having the sensory cells in, in the, at the front end. And that soon developed into the, the head and, the, and, a, and, a, and a brain, the nervous system, like a ladder after that, like we see in the flatworms. The flatworms, as we talked, they, they, they belong to the group, group Lophotrochosoa. It's a mix. Um, we will look at the annelids uh, in that group, Lophotrochosoa. Um, we will look at the crustaceans, that is a group Ectysosoa, that has this um, exoskeleton, very thick skeleton. They didn't need to molt in order for them to grow they must change the skeleton and get the new skeleton that is soft, then they can grow a bit. Um, so they have this ectusone growth hormone that is uh, in common for those. And there we have the crustaceans, we have the, the insects. It's a very big group. And then we look at the deuterostomians. That's our group that we are, uh, the, the vertebrates, also tunicates and uh, echinoderms. Um, we, go, we have internal skeleton. Uh, echinoderms have it too. So let's see the next. This is also like the, the evolutionary uh, tree. Um, this time you see from ancestral protist, single cell organisms, but you see the same uh, general uh, uh, outline of this. Um, so, uh, bilateral symmetry, you have it down at uh, the lower end, a radial symmetry over there because of connectivity to the function. When you are crawling, you need bilateral symmetry. And then some animals become sessile, sit, just sit and still at the bottom again, and they retain, they get this uh, rounded symmetry back. So it's always flows, the life and the shapes and the form flows through the millennia depending on the lifestyle. But then uh, DNA can help us to create this uh, evolutionary tree and follow all these meandering paths of the organ systems through the ages. Okay. So if we were talking about the, the Lophotrochosoa, if I take it back, the Lophotrochosoans, uh, these are the mollusks, flatworms, and annelids here. And also some other groups, uh, because they, some of them are lophophorates, brachiopods, a, a kind of a, a feeding mechanism, uh, lophophore, also in bryozoans, actually. Um, trochozoa, because some of them have as a trochophoran larva, a special kind of larva with a tuft in the head, a troch, like it's carrying a troch, this like lophotrochozoa. But if we... Uh, go through Lophotrochoa then. Phylum annelida as a representative of the Lophotrochozoa. So mind I'm taking this off. Um, the Phylum annelida, the segmented worms, they have a body in segments and each of these segments have a body cavity that we, that we don't have in the flatworms. So this is a, like a, a novelty here. First, there must have been some animal without segments, but you have a cavity. But each of these segments are separated by a septum. But there's at least this, there are, are, are um, repeated segments uh, with similar function. And they have a skin with a protective cuticle layer uh, that is pretty tough. 
um, that you it develops into uh, the the hard layer you find in crustaceans. But typical for the annelids, they also have these bristles, the stiff hairs of chitin, which helps them to move. And they also have the first with the, the ventral nerve cord. Like we have, we have, we have a uh, dorsal nerve cord just below our, our spine. But this group, um, Lophotrochosoans and Nectosoans, the protostomes, they got it on the, on the belly because it's protected on the belly. So one can ask, why do we have on, on the backside? It's because we have a corda that protected the, the, the nervous the nerve stem. So that's the important difference between uh, protostomes and deuterostomes. One of the different, uh, deeply different, different paths of life that take the, the, the split was in the Cambrium uh, more than half a billion years ago. So they got 9,000 species worldwide. And the, the traditional way to, 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 uh, to classify all these annelids is that they have those in the marine uh, habitats, the polychaetes with long bristles, lots of long bristles, polychaete, many bristles. And some of them are free living. Um, and some of them are, are sessile, sitting in the bottom. Some of them are collecting food and they get collecting apparatus that is radially symmetric, round. And even the spoon worms, Echiura belongs here. They don't does look like polychaetes, but DNA showed us they actually belong in that group, even if they are derived. They look in different way. They don't have the they don't have the bristles anymore. And then you know the uh, the earthworms, the earthworms, they evolved from the marine polychaetes. The ordinary earthworm that is girdled, that they have a girdle um, to make a cocoon, because they must have a cocoon for the eggs and the, uh, the young larva, because they come from the sea, so they need to make a cocoon. By, by the, they have this, the girdle have these mucus glands, so they actually the girdle produced a lot of slime, mucus, and, and the, the worm uh, just deposits the eggs inside of it. That's why they have the girdle. And then the leeches develop from the earthworms. The leeches, as you maybe know from if you were walking in the rainforest. I remember when I was walking in the rainforest in Kalimantan a long time ago, we have these leeches, one the dropping from above, and the leeches that come from, from uh, sit on the ground and try to jump on your, your shoes. Um, for the one who goes first, just, he just arises the, 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 the leeches and the second and third pe person gets the leeches and the one who is in the back, there's no leeches left. So he, oh, there's always a struggle to be in the front. Uh, but leeches actually develop first in the sea because you have oligochaetes, that's marine too. So leak, you can find some marine leeches that still have the bristles. Um, they go for this uh, they attack uh, cartilaginous fish like skates and rays, and some fish, bony fish. Those are the very primitive early leeches. So it's a more advanced ones you found with that uh, with annoy you in the, in the forest. So this is a, an example of, of an annelid um, with a different part of an annelid. You see the head uh, and all the segments. And there are these parapodia sticking out because it, this is the basal outline, but it also makes opens up the possibility that different segments have different function as a, as a toolbox. This is like when you have this from a single cell to, to multiple cell in metazoa, then different cells can do different things. And also you have in the segmented worm actually opens them the possibility for the different segments to do different chores, do different things. And below here you see some examples of different uh, polychaetes. Some of them even reproduce by budding. You see them to the left, uh, uh, sulid budding off new individuals. Uh, 
what you see here is also examples of these free living predatory polychaetes, these worms uh, that crawl around on the seafloor, uh, very active predators, many of them active at night because the fish won't see them. Uh, and you have, have a lot of species in Indonesia. These are actually uh, from Atlantic, North Atlantic species, but you have the same, you have the, 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 the same families in, in Indonesia. They look a bit similar, uh, even with the, uh, the palula worm, maybe you've heard of that, that it's, um, you find on, on the coral reefs uh, and, and they are, when they are spawning at certain, at certain uh, full moon nights uh, in the year, they, they release the, 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 the behind half of the body that is full with eggs. Eggs and some, with, uh, so when they re release that in the in the water, but the the rest of the worm stays hidden in the coral reef. But that pine part, just full of eggs, is very nutritious, and uh, some people uh, people eat it, collect them, and eat them, and then fry them, because it's eggs. Eggs are always eggs. Um, so we we have the same families in Sweden, uh, but we don't have these concerted big spawnings, so it's hard to collect the the eggs. But they're mostly, you can see them in springtime. That's the spawning, that's the mating time for these worms. But if you have these um, sedentary uh, groups, uh, like the subbelly, that they make these tubes and they have this, this filter apparatus that is getting a round symmetry, actually. And you have this, um, uh, it looks like a, an ice cream cone, a long ice cream cone. It's actually a, a group of, of uh, sedentary polyps makes these these uh, cones, and they are insert. They sit in the in the in the in the bottom. And I was talking about the um, thumb and down to the left. You see, there's a serpuli. They make these calcar these tubes made from uh, calcareous uh, substance. Um, so it's very hard. It's hard as rock. And then this filter feeding apparatus sticking out. And actually one of the tentacles is uh, transformed into a lid so they can close the lid. And inside the lid, they have their eggs as well. And to the lower right, you see Uricus capo. This is called the fat innkeeper. It's an echuroid. Echuroids is common in mangrove forests in Indonesia. I think they're called peanut worms. It could be very common um, and important for, for the marine uh, habitat, actually. This species is from the um, uh, Pacific uh, on, the, on the east side. They call it the fat innkeeper because it makes a burrow. Uh, so he's, it's the ink, it, it keeps the burrow. And there are lots of other animals living inside the burrow. So it's more like a, he's the innkeeper for everyone there. But it doesn't really have the bristles anymore. So and this is a clitellate, the, the earthworm, you see the clitellum, the thick uh, section, almost at the uh, fore end, this makes the cocoon. These earthworms live this burrowing lifestyle in earth. You have some marine species also that doesn't either go into soft bottom. But you also have this, um, the skin has this cuti cuticle layer that is uh, kind of rough and tough. So it's it's not the real it's not the real living skin like we have because they are covered with this cuticle. And down to down then you see uh, a leech, uh, uh, a species of leech that attacks a scalping a, a marine fish. The, the primitive, the first basal leeches that still have their bristles. But uh, they are very advanced, those that sucks blood from, from uh, mammals and birds that live in, in land to be able to, to feed on blood and store that for a long time. So if you leave, that's, that was just a bit short about the, the analysts. And it's a very important group. Uh, and we go to the ectisozoans, those uh, who has a thick exoskeleton. The skeleton is on the outside. Um, and they need to molt it, otherwise they cannot grow. So they may be molting a dozen times while they live. 
um, and they're molting and for a while the, 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 the new exoskeleton is soft so they can pump it up a bit and then let it harden. So they have some space to, to, to grow on inside. Like you buy new clothes that's much bigger than before and they grow inside of it. Um, typical for, for the crustaceans though, that group, there's two pairs of antenna, one small first and then a second one. Uh, they got compound eyes, just like insects. Actually, you see this small, if you look closely at a crab or a lobster or, 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 or some other uh, crustacean, you see actually they have these facets. It looks like uh, the eye of a fly, actually. And there are reasons for that. These compound eyes that each little tiny eye creates uh, an image of the the world what they see and they, they they create their vision from 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 all of those small eyes and there's lots and lots of crustaceans 40 thousand uh, extant species worldwide but it's nothing to the insects but in in classic uh, taxonomy these these are the uh, the groups of of crustaceans i will just go through a few of them because there's so much uh, there's even a, uh, a parasitic group, the Ichthyostraca, uh, that have become in, in, internal parasites, some of them, and they have lost the exoskeleton and they look like worms. The tongue worms, the pentastomids, uh, a, lo a lot of tourists, a lot of tourists, free searches, they were, had, had this enigma, they didn't know what it was uh, before they could check with DNA and look at certain structures. So. Uh, this is a, a modern phylogeny and evolutionary tree of the, uh, the what's it called crustaceans. They are, uh, you see, ectis or so once you also have the, the round worms on there, the nematodes, of course, they also mold, but the, the, they are being, have been parasitic or they live inside the soil, so they have lost all they have lost the legs, they are worm like again. They had legs, the, 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 the ancestor must have had legs. It was lost somehow. And now, uh, as we know today, the insects developed evolutionary within the crustaceans. So the insects, the flies, um, uh, or, or, or the, anything with the butterflies and all this, uh, actually evolved within the crustaceans as a marine group. So hexapoda with the six legs down there at the bottom, that is the insects. So that's quite amazing because in, insects never, never conquered the sea because it was already occupied by the crustaceans. The insects could uh, explore land in, in, in the, the earlier ages after the Cambrium, the Ordovicium, uh, and, and those ages, are, we're talking about 400 billion years ago, when plants were coming up on the land and the, and, and the early, early uh, arthropods that developed into, into insects and then developed, the, uh, uh, they, could, they, they got wings, they can fly. So if you look at an insect and, and a crustacean, insect below, crustacean above, they have the basically same body structure with, with the segments. Um, in the middle, you can actually, that's, a, that's an annelid, how the annelids look like. But in, in, in crustaceans and also even more in the insects, part of these segments has been fused into sections. The word where the word insecta means in sections. So you see the 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 head is uh, a couple of uh, um, it's actually several segments that have been fused. The thorax is three segments that are fused, and then you have the abdomen, several segments. But you see the similar homologous, the same segments you can trace in the crustaceans. To to show you some groups of crustaceans, how diverse they are, I will go. With, go uh, present some of them. Maybe you know the copepods. The, the, those are miniaturized. They, are crazy. The, 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 they have been so small because they are living in the plankton. And to be able to live in plankton, 
is advantages to be very tiny, just half a centimeter, a few millimeters. And this is like the Colanus, Colanus femarchicus is maybe the most the com most common animals in the world. And billions and billions in the big oceans, in the temperate oceans. It's a that, that's what um, whales filter. They filter the copepods and the krill filter them. Very very small and lots of species out in the big oceans. And if you consider that the, this planet should be called planet wo uh, planet water, not planet Earth, because most of it is water, 77%. 70, oh, okay, that's a lot. Um, here's the uh, sea repeats, uh, Tecostraca, the barnacles, uh, the, 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 um, the exoskeleton actually is turned into a calcareous shell when they're sitting on rocks or maybe ship hulls or anything. And it becomes radially symmetric again. And they throw out the legs to collect food. So there's more than 1,000 species of cirripedes, barnacles. And then a group isopods, uh, sea lice. They are flattened from abo above. Idotia baltica is now a species you can see here. More than 10,000 species of those flattened from above. And then you have the other group, the sister group, amphipods. The amphipods, uh, they are flattened from the sides. Uh, here you have um, like the ghost shrimps, not so many in Indonesia, um, many species here. Amphipod is Ephemedia obesa, the beautiful species. And you can often find even very beautiful species on, on the coral reefs. Uh, if you really look, they're, they're tiny, but they can grow to a, a decimeter maybe. Uh, there is a one called the jellyfish amphipod that, that sits inside of jellyfish and eats them from inside. So <laughs> and it's good, but they, they, they control the amount of jellyfish. It could be very common otherwise here. So if you look in a jellyfish, you can see there's something sitting inside. They have very large compound, uh, compound eyes. And here's a very specific group, the, uh, the stom stomatopods, the mantis shrimps that you find in, in, in warm seas and tropical seas with 450 species. Very typical, very fast and quick animals that is active in the day. And you can see them, they are very territorial in the coral reefs and in shallow water. Uh, they have, uh, some of them have this. Uh, arms that can really smash really hard like a rifle or, or grab with the spear like a mantis. That's what they call this mantis shrimps. Uh, they have burrows, um, deep burrows. Or, um, some species get big. It's 30, 40 centimeters, small ones often. And they have very, very, very complex eyes. If you see the eyes that's on stalks, um, but we have we, our rods in our eyes, in the, our retina, we have rods that is uh, sensitive to three peaks of, of light. And so we see the combinations of those in, when we see color. But they got, they got 32 different uh, pigments for rods, 32 different sorts. So they have this wonderful, extremely uh, good vision. They can even see polarized light. That is, is one, one, one specific angle, or even something called um, circular polarized light. Uh, so, why do they have, they have this? Often they're just sticking up the heads up, looking, and they can see things. I remember a long time ago, I was snorkeling uh, uh, outside the island of Gili Travangan outside Lombok. That was in uh, 1992. Uh, and certainly, so as I was snorkeling, I certainly saw a stomatopod swimming up to me from the bottom, coming up, and I wondered why. But then I realized that there was a fly stuck in the arm, um, in the hair of my arms. I got a bit hairy arms. So the stomatopod went up and lightly picked the, the fly from, from my arm, and they went back, back down again. So it could actually see 
from below, from two, two meters depth, here's someone coming, snorkeling, and there is a fly sitting in, on his arm. <laughs> Just to, as an example on this extremely good vision. So I guess we could learn a lot about uh, when doing research on that group. Um, and this is the, the Caridians, the, the true shrimps. Um, we eat a lot of uh, uh, farmed shrimps, but there's a lot of species. Uh, um, in, in English, they the separate uh, prawn uh, compressed from the side and shrimp <laughs> compressed from above. Two different, that's in English, if you wonder about shrimps and prawns. Um, in some languages, in, in Swedish, we, we call them the same. We call it reaka. And you say udang. I, I think udang is the same, just prawn and shrimp. Um, that could be a good thing to know as a biologist. And then we have the lobsters. They look like this, the big lobsters. And you have spiny lobsters. Some they don't have the, 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 the claws. European lobster, Norway lobsters. They are common here. And just, uh, right now in autumn, just right now is the, the lobster time the, when people are hunting lobsters, putting out the cages in the sea because it's free to, for everyone to, to put out the cage and try to find the lobster. So it's very popular on the Swedish West Coast. And that's why almost no lobsters live for very long. All most of them end up in somebody's, um, somebody's pot, cooking pot. Uh, but there's restrictions, so we don't have to, you must make sure that we get new lobsters. And they're absolutely delicious. Same as Norway lobsters, they have lots of that. And then we come to the true crabs, the 7,000 species. Uh, you have lots of true crabs. Um, you see this, they are kind of wide on the side, or walk on the side. And here it's clear to see that all the, on, all the segments, the segments have different kind of legs. The legs have developed in different shapes for different use, like the pincers to, to open food and keep food. And then you have the walking legs uh, and there are some other kind of legs, um, but not so few of them. There were more, more legs in, in the, the base, other groups of, of, of crustaceans like the amphipods. Uh, the edible crab, Atlantic one, nut crab. The resource crab is a santide. Santide is a family that you have uh, certain species of in Indonesia, Australia, Indonesia, up to Japan. Those are a bit special because they, they, they live actually by filtering water. And they are not crossing things. The, 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 the big thongs that are used for defense. Because they filter, uh, filter food, they, they can get toxic because they get... Um, um, they, they, they are massing uh, toxic substances from the algae they eat. So those could be toxic to eat. Yeah. And finally, we get to the deuterostomia, the big group deuterostomia where we belong. The deuterostomians, different from proteostomians, is as in the early embryonal stage, the gastrodermal stage, we look like a small raspberry with 64 cells there is a new mouth coming on the side. And the original opening on this uh, uh, gastro, uh, uh, gastrula becomes the anus. But in the protostomes, the other group, the uh, annelids and the crabs and the insects, that becomes the mouth. Uh, and also in echinodermata here, the sea stars and sea urchins, I will come to that. Uh, they have these five arms, very special, but they also have inner skeletal plates, small, small, small parts of the skeletal plates uh, uh, surrounded by tissue, just like in us, actually. So they got an inner, they got an inner skeleton. It's not an exoskeleton. This is this is the same uh, solution we have. And also look DNA. So we are related to sea stars, however strange that might seem. There's about 7,000 species living today, many in the fossil. Um, the main groups, crinozoans, astrozoans, echinozoans. And this is, you can see, uh, I, I didn't find any good uh, evolutionary trees, so I had to write my own. But because um, half a billion years ago, 
in the cambrium, they lived the thing called Cteno imbricata spinosa. Uh, there was, it, was, it had two sides, just like us. Two sides, biradial symmetry, and he was crawling on the bottom, but he had his mouth on the, up, on the upside. So it was filtering food. It was filtering food uh, like a tunicate. Uh, and, and, and like uh, hemicordata, another group of worms actually have this filtering apparatus. And you can also find that in early fish, like in the hagfish, before they got a uh, jaw. Um, but later on in the fossil series, you find that some of the, 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 the they were becoming sessile, they were sitting, they, were, they, they got stuck, they had this stalk, and then they got. Uh, a circular symmetry, but with five arms. Uh, and, the, and the hypothesis is that because of the skeletal plates, they call the stereom, this, it, this kind of affects the body. So you have these five arms that is, fits that best. And then in, we see, see in the fossil series, there was a period in, in Silurian, there was a lot of uh, rapid evolution of other benthic animals, other animals living in the sea. So maybe they were attacking so much these sessile uh, echinoderm just sitting there. So some of them went with the mouth downwards instead because otherwise you just had the mouth upwards, like in the crinoids, the feather stars, but now it's, they turned down, but still kept this, 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 this shape of five arms. So that's what you have in the sea stars, the brittle stars, and the sea urchins, and the sea cucumbers, this symmetry of five arms, in, especially in sea stars and brittle stars. But in sea urchins, it's like a, it's like a ball. It looks like a ball, but you still have five, five furrows where you have this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this arms, and these special tube feet they have. And the sea cucumbers, they may have been long, so like long cylinders, but they still have tentacles with this uh, pentaradial five symmetry. I'll show you some of them. So this is this, this uh, feather stars and sea lilies. Some of them now, the, some of them are stalks, the sea lilies. But the feather stars, very common on coral reefs in Indonesia. This is from Sweden, actually. They can swim a little bit. And they actually have five arms, but they are split in two, so it looks so it becomes ten. But they have the mouth upwards. And then we have the sea stars; those are turned with the mouth down and started to crawl slowly. They are very slow crawlers; otherwise, they need to be have two symmetries like that. But we have, and we have a spiny star fish, a cushion star, the purple sun star. You can see they have multiple, so multiple arms. So it's some of them loses this uh, five star symmetry and get five arm and get more arms, maybe 20 arms. But this purple sun star is a predator on other sea stars. So it's a bit special. And some of them turn, look like more like suns with a lot of rays. And then you have the, the brittle stars, brittle because the arms are very easily broken up. They are brittle. But these are the experts uh, to live on deep sea. They are very common in the deep sea, deeper areas. And also in round coral reefs. Uh, in corals, so you, you find they're not so, lots of species, but then, then they're very, very common. But deeper sea, there can be lots of them. And up here in the Swedish west coast, there could be sometimes be lots and lots of, of brittle stars covering the floor and if you lay down you stay on the down they start crawling up on you and if i would stay there and sleep on the uh, floor they would cover me uh, so active predators and then here you see the the sea urchins they just like a ball but if you look closely they have these five furrows with the tube feet so it's like it's like a, a, a sea star that bends up and ties its arms in at the top. They sit on the bottom, um, and they they feed on algae, so they are vegetarians. And from them, uh, develop the 
the burrowing sea urchins, they burrow, they, they are digging in soft bottom. And they're moving in soft bottom, eating detritus. And that because that, that is, makes them resistance to move in sand or mud. So they have gotten this bilater bilateral symmetry again, two sides, even if they have this five, five uh, rows with uh, the tube feet. So they have two sides. So again, they have this bi bilateral symmetry, just like their ancestor half a billion years ago, 500 million years, they are back. <laughs> so that's full circle. But that is evolution. Doesn't plan ahead, it just happens. Um, and also the, the, the Holoturians, the sea cucumber, uh, C, uh, that depends on how C is uh, pronounced in, in English. So it's not chuchamber, uh, as you would say in Indonesia. Uh, so sea cucumbers, uh, some of them have these five furrows. And in many, many species, these tube feet have been scattered throughout, but they still have these tentacles. So they are actually related to, to sea urchins because of similarities in, in, the, in the circular system around the around the, the mouth area. But they get long, long, long stretched out synaptides. Have some of them look like a garden hose, several meters long. Um, some of them leaves burrowing, but they, they don't move around in the bottom. They, they, just, they just dig down and sit there and just, just extend the tentacles at night and then go down so they hide. Uh, yes, that, uh, this could be eaten. Uh, it's called trepang. Um, also, like some of the other uh, sea uh, kind of drugs could be eaten. The sea urchin, you eat the, the eggs because eggs could almost always be eaten. Well, that was a very short introduction to some of these groups and some of the uh, some of the rep representatives of the big groups within the higher metazoa, and then you could go on to chordates and, 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 and uh, tunicates. It would be interesting to hear all about that. So I can say uh, thank you for listening to me. Terima kasih tala mendengarkan saya. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kinnit. Then we can continue to the next lecture. Dr. Mijen. Oke. Okay. Yeah. Uh, baik. Uh, Anin, can you hear me? Yes. My voice is uh, clear. Up. A bit not clear, but. Okay, it's not a clear or. No, it's clear. Yeah. Okay, I hope we'll continue with a clear voice. I think. Okay, so. Maybe I, uh, how, uh, Dr. Anin, I uh, start? Yes, you can start now. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Kinet. You can have a break. Terima kasih. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Kinet. It's a yeah. nice presentation. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I would like to share my screen. Wait. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, already here. Oh. Okay, wait. So, okay, good uh, evening, everybody. So, it's uh, very great. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to this international lecture uh, is held by uh, Dr. Anin with the world class professor. And this is my honor to be a presenter in this uh, occasion. So uh, maybe uh, we, we continue with the new uh, topic. It's about uh, the Braves one. So I put this topic, the Braves one, 
uh, potential biodiversity and prospect of the neglected marine fauna in Indonesia. So maybe neglected in here is uh, in Bahasa, we call it uh, terabaikan. So we can we can uh, recognize that Brazilian is very neglected in Indonesia. So in here, I would like to uh, to present you what is the Brazilian, what is the general characteristic of the Brazilian, and also what is the the research uh, Brazilian in Indonesia. So in here we can see is the beautiful Brazilian is a uh, taken by Christian Waldrick is from Mero. Uh, we can see him, uh, Mr. Kenneth and also uh, Miss Resi, Mrs. Resi is from Mero. So uh, Christian Waldrick is also from Mero. They they took the photo uh, about the Brazilian and it's very beautiful. Yeah, you can see in here. Okay, so I would oh yes, sir. Okay, I would like to start with the introduction. So in here, uh, before we uh, in, enter to the Brazilian, I mean we start with the Brazilian. I would like to uh, inform you. So where is the exactly Brazilian is? I mean, is uh, Brazilian is that a species or the genus or maybe the phylum maybe, or the, the class. So in here we can see, uh, we have to know that Animalia Kingdom, yeah, Animalia Kingdom has uh, 33 phyla. So it's very big uh, diverse of Animalia Kingdom. But maybe in the lecture, in the class, we just only know about the major, the phyla is like uh, spawns, polyvera, and also nidaria and maybe echinodermata and also the arthropod and, and anything else, annelids, but we don't know what the minor phyla. And this one, the brass one is the phylum, uh, but they, they include uh, in the minor phyla. So maybe in this, uh, in the class, maybe in the uh, marine infrared, invertebrates, Maybe uh, we just know what is the Brazilian and also that's it. We just we don't know how how about the life of the Brazilian. So in here I would like to inform you maybe a little bit uh, because me uh, I also still uh, learning. I'm also still learning about the Brazilian until now. So in here we can see this Animalia Kingdom has a uh, thirty three phyla. And also they are major and minor phyla, and the Brazilian is the minor phyla. If you can see in here, major is a manelids, a arthropod, mollus, echinodermata, and also the nidaria, and also the polyphera. That's a major phyla. So because they are uh, easy to recognize in the field, in the ocean, we can see it with the naked eye. So maybe it's, uh, it's easy to know what is the, the animal, what is this uh, organism. So Brazilian is very difficult to, to recognize in this uh, in the fight in the field. So in here, uh, the Brazilian is the group of lophophorids. Lophophorids means they have uh, some function organ in uh, their body and also in their uh, in their yeah in their, maybe in this group they have a friend to catch the 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 food by the cilia so that's the different maybe this this is the first different with the cnidaria so maybe we, we will talk about this later so and also the brazilian is also known as uh, the ectoprota so we can see in if we hear uh, we can see in here ectoprota so we have an endoprota so ectoprota is the Ecto is a uh, outside, procta is the, we can see this anus. So the, I mean the organ with the, uh, with excrete, but the excrete something, uh, digestive uh, uh, byproduct. So the, the ecto is the outside. So they don't have a uh, same uh, organ, just like a uh, nidaria. Uh, it's a, uh, I think that is uh, endoprocta because they, have a mouth, 
mouth and anus, they have a same uh, function. I mean the same uh, direction, okay, the same uh, function. So when we, uh, when the coral, I mean, we take a uh, example, Nidaria is the coral. Uh, uh, when uh, coral is, it's the food, when they will uh, excrete the food, the, the byproduct of the food, they just uh, use the same with the mouth. So that's called endoprocta. But Rezuan is uh, ectoprocta. So the mouth and anus is a different uh, organ, something like that. So about the ectoprocta. So that's about the taxonomy of, of Rezuan and also this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is about the price one by the general. So we can see this is, uh, we can see the species in here, the example of the species of the price one. And also the price one is the sessile. Yeah, they, they attach in maybe in the hard substrate. Uh, uh, yeah, most, but maybe it's just 1% or less, less 1% they are free living. Yeah, but most of the price one is sessile. And also a colonial organism. So yeah, if you know the coral, they, they also the colonial organisms. So they make uh, if you know the coral is we have an individual organism called and with a a little bit. Uh, so, uh, so, the is this price one or not? So, because they have a high variable morphology, in this is the maybe we can see the difference of most. Uh, like uh, animal. So when we call it a bright one, is the etymology of the Greek, uh, Greek. I mean, a uh, Greek from Yunani. Uh, it's a prayo. Prayo is the moss. Moss is in Indonesia or in Bahasa we call it umut. So it's just like a a plant. Uh, a plant. Are uh, animal. So maybe we make a country there because. When we like it, when we see this, when we see this picture, it's just a, a like a plant. So it's very mis uh, often to be mistaken when we identify, oh, this is a, maybe some algae or maybe some uh, Gorgonian or something like that. So that's why the price one is, yeah, it's under, uh, under research, under explore. Now, so we have a uh, flat encrusting. Uh, uh, it's a, it's called a cement. So we can see in here a for membrane. They encrust, they attach in the leaves of the algae. Then with the visual. Is uh, so I uh, we have uh, I think the I, I in main the the bread one uh, they live in fifteen hundred uh, fifteen hundred thousand years ago, so it's very long time. For the price one until now and now we can see in here more than uh and thirty three hundred green species but for the fossil species yes, they have a uh, 15 thousand uh, have been described so more than uh yeah i mean uh it's a big enough i mean it's a very large uh, identification 
this one. Uh, challenging in here. Okay, for the introduction, yes, we can see this uh, picture in here. We can see this one is uh, rigid. Yeah, I, I forgot about this. Uh, erect, uh, robust, rigid. Yeah, uh, we also know the lace coral. The lace uh, coral is but it's just like hole in here. And also we can see in here, I mean, so I would like to inform you about the general about the Brazilian. So you have to know what is the Brazilian, and then we have uh, and then we can. Okay, so the characteristic of Brazilian in here is individual organism. It's called zoid. It's the same with the coral. We have an individual organism. It's called polyp, and also they make. Uh, budding and then make a colonial organism they make uh, one uh, organism with the individual organism uh, many many individual organisms in that just like a coral uh, yeah <clears throat> Call the name uh, individual is uh, different so and then the mostly have a calcareous skeleton so basic mm -hmm. uh, Based on this uh, research, in this reference, uh, the French one have a very, very diverse in, in about the exoskeleton. I mean the calcare. So the form, the form of the the shape of the French one body is mostly uh, hard. I mean it's very rigid. But yeah, still they have uh, yeah, and calcified is still uh, the French one is also they have it. And also one of uh, lobophoric groups. We can uh, we can see we can know about this before. Uh, and also they they have advanced and complex body structure, and then a polymorphism organism. So here we can see the the picture. It's about the nidarian, the corals, and also the brazilian. And I won't like to show you where what is the difference between coral and the brazil one i mean the nidarian because this is a same same uh, film uh brazil one is a film uh this also the the faces from the from nidaria so the first uh first uh classification brazil one is put in the nidaria because the the form, the shape, and this, the form of the body of the Brazilian is almost the same with the Nigeria. But maybe in uh, 69 uh, years, yeah, in the years uh, 1969, they uh, realized it is this Brazilian is different with the Nigeria. What makes uh, Brazilian distinguish the Nigeria is I, I talk. Uh, so to before is the in anus. You can see in here. Wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, illustrated picture. You can see in here. This is the mouth of the breast one, and here is anus. So they make a U shape, something like that. The breast one is like this, but in Nidaria, uh, we we can see is a. Corals, they have, they don't have, uh, just like in Brazil one, it's because they have a one open function is the same, it's a mouth in here, but for the uh, anus, maybe the excrete to, uh, yeah, to excrete the, the, yeah, the material of in the prior product from the, the food, yeah, they, they have a same, uh, same, Door, yeah, same door. Okay, the same origin. So that makes a uh, why uh, Nidarian uh, distinguish with uh, Brazilian. So Brazilian uh, exclude from the Nidaria, from the Nidaria, and also they make a uh, another film. So now it's called a uh, film Brazilian. Okay, next is yeah, this one is uh, sorry. Okay, wait. I, I would like to show you what is different about 
to I hope uh, wait. okay <clears throat> I hope this, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would like to show you what is different. Now, uh, I hope this video uh, can uh, play clearly in your, uh, in your screen. Okay, so now in here is Bryce one, we have a Lovo 4, because Lovo 4 is uh, different with the Nidarian in here. They have same uh, tentacles in there, but what makes a uh, difference between Brez one and also Nidaria? Brez one didn't have, uh, doesn't have uh, the nematosis that make, uh, the cell that makes uh, paralyzed with the uh, prey or maybe the predator that they have uh, maybe some toxin in there, some phenom in there. So we can see in here, it just uh, have a cilia. Yeah. They have a cilia in there in this and it's uh, to uh, distinguish with a person and also area. It doesn't have a uh, nematosis. Okay, so you can see in tentacle in here is very, very uh, interesting. I mean, it's very interesting uh, research in here. They put uh, how can they they excrete the phenom in here from the tentacle. I, I focus in the area first. They put some uh, electricity that, that can make a uh, tentacle respond to this electricity. So they, they excrete the phenom in here, the nematosis in here, in the tentacle. It's very interesting uh, research. Next, of the development of Brazil one. So, if you can see, this one is also uh, <clears throat> this one is also the key for the identification of the Brazilian because of the development of the Brazilian. So we can now uh, we know that uh, individual organism of Brazilian is called GP. So we have a characteristic is a polymorphism. Polymorphism we have. Uh, different morphology uh, between one individual organism, uh, even though that they, they are uh, one species and also another species. So they call polymorphism. And here comprise uh, autozoid. Yeah, autozoid is very uh, simple. It's very simple price one. We can see in here is a example of the autozoid. This one is a picture of the membrane membrane. They have just uh, autozoid. I mean, autozoid is uh, auto automatic. Is, uh, yeah, they have a uh, just only to take uh, uh, I mean to take uh, food by from the lophophoric in here. You can see in here. So this one is uh, encrusting membranipora in the leaf of the uh, algae. I mean, this one is macrocystis, maybe, uh, maybe or maybe the. Yeah, maybe it's a brown algae, I think. And also, this one is a living. Um, in here. Yeah, and then for the uh, picture, scanning electron uh, microscope in here. So we can see this one is this, this is called autozoid, autozoid. And then the next one. It's called uh, apicularium, and also the official in here is about the reproductive uh, polymorphism. They produce the eggs and also the sperm in there. And also, uh, this one is kenozoic. This one, uh, the tree. Maybe we can see in. Uh, the next, yeah, this one is a uh, apicularia of the price one. This one is uh, actually this one is one uh, zoid, but they uh, they uh, make I mean uh, they transform into different uh, form into different say of the normal autozoid because they have function in here. You can see in here 
uh, they have just like uh, yeah, you can see it's uh, just like a head bird, right? Just like a head bird, and then like uh, they can take the food from there and also from the defense from the region. So they make a more visible in here. It's called articular. This one uh, also the key of the identification of the brazil they have articularity or not and also uh, the key of the identification of brazil you can see in here is a living uh, okay okay uh, my voice is still clear clear okay so now uh we move to the ecology of the brazilian so we know we 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 already know about the, the general characteristics of the brazilian and so the i mean the yeah the development of the brazilian and also the zoid is a very very uh, important in brazilian so now we move to the ecology of the brazilian so we we just we have to know about the ecology uh uh what is the function in the of the brazilian so the first thing is uh brazilian is to be creators organism so we can uh uh take i mean we can see the brazilian uh actually is everywhere i mean from the intertidal zone until the deep zone i mean it's very uh abyssal maybe we can get the brazilian we can uh see the brazilian but how to recognize that is Brazilian or not? Uh, so we have uh, to know more about the Brazilian. But actually, they they are ubiquitous. I mean, it's everywhere. We can we can find it. We can uh, we can know notice that oh, that is Brazilian in every uh, every maybe every zone. So next is a few have been found in deep sea trends. This is a very update of the. The research of the Brazilian, they put just like this. If you can see the picture in here is Abyssal. Uh, the Brazilian uh, collected in the Abyssal zone, they have a one kilometer, uh, approximately one kilometer. But uh, we found, I mean, the researcher found the uh, Brazilian in there. And also, mostly found all the type of subtrats because the nature of the brazilian they are assessing so if we want to uh, find the brazilian so we have to see the hard substance maybe the cell fragment of the bifals or maybe yeah it's a maybe the trash in the maybe like a uh, hard trash is a bottle or maybe uh i mean yeah it's uh anything uh hard so we can find uh, probability we have a more probability to find one in the hard substrate maybe in the corals they have uh, besides uh, they live here beside with the corals we can uh, maybe we can find it uh, in the field like that and also organism i mean this uh, food is the microorganism we can see the maybe the unicellular algae and also diatoms uh and also maybe the bacteria in here so the food of the brazilian is uh diatoms and also the unicellular algae i mean the microorganism and yeah uh maybe uh uh dr resi and also dr uh, kinet uh also inform us about the predator of the brazilian and also we know that's our prey on Grazing organisms just like a sea urchin, nudibranch, and also fish. This is the predator of the brazilian. And also, we have to know that brazilian not only is not only in the marine uh, field, it's not only in ocean, but also we can find it in the fresh water environment. Okay, so that's why we we, we have uh, maybe some of a fossil brazilian in there. This one, we move to the classification of Brazilian. So I put maybe this one is a little bit, uh, it's just an uh, introduction. In here, we can see this one, the 
uh, most living organism of Bryozoan that we can found now, that we can found uh, recently in this field. So the first thing is the class Gymnolimata, and also the class of Stenolimata in there. So you can see in here, uh, for now, the most living Bryozoan are celostome. This is uh, from the class Gymnolimata in order in the celostome in here. Is the most living Bryozoan that we can found in maybe uh, in in all over the world. I mean, from the Antarctica and also from the deep uh, sea. And also, we have uh, order Stenostomata in there, and also in here a uh, class Stenolimata is uh, order Cyclostomata. Uh, in here we have a living uh, organism of the Bryozoan, but we have uh, still the class from uh, the order from the class Stenolomata is have maybe uh, I, I forgot the amount of the order of uh, Stenolomata, but mostly they are fossil Bryozoan. So in the class Gymnolomata, they have only two order, Celestomata and also the Stenolomata, but from the class Stenolomata, they have a more order in there. But another order, uh, we, call, we call it in Bahasa Ordo. So they have more Ordo, but they are fossil Brazilian. Okay, so maybe if we want to talk about the fossil Brazilian, we can, we can learn together, we can, we can discuss together in the next uh, time, maybe in the next uh, occasion. So this one, we have a uh, fresh water that, as I said before, is a class phylo, phyla, uh, Philactolimata. So this one is a class especially from fresh water. So, okay, we move to why Brazilian is neglected, why Brazilian is terabaikan in Brazil. Because the first thing that you know, because the size of the Brazilian is very small, because we can see, I mean, we can identify this organism by morphology is just only we have uh, we have to know about the microscopic uh, shape, microscopic form. So we cannot recognize, we cannot identify when we are in the field. I mean, maybe the the of the they they have a very uh, remarkable knowledge of brains recognize. But uh, we, uh, I, I mean, uh, they have some, uh, they have still uh, to find out with the uh, same. I mean, we have to check it, recheck it again with the scanning electron microscope if we want to take a, a morphology of the organism. Because the zoid, yeah, uh, individual organism, they have uh, normally is a, uh, yeah, around, uh, this one is, uh, yeah, it's about a 500 uh, micrometer in height. And also why the Brazilian is neglected, they're typically natural color. So uh, because we, yeah, we, we naturally, when we go to the sea, we, we take a diving, we, we just see the beautiful color in the coral space, maybe the nudie brands also, they have a beautiful colors, but uh, Brazilian, they have a very natural colors. I mean, white or maybe the gray, uh, maybe just a uh, dark purple, something like that. So that's why uh, Brazilian is neglected. And also they are superficially plain like apron. So I mean this appearance, I mean this form of the Brazilian, this body of the Brazilian, this colony of the Brazilian is just like a plant. So maybe they just recognize, oh, this plant, I want to take a marine invertebrate, not a plant. So that's why uh, Brazilian is neglected too. And also, we have uh, we have to know that Brazilian is a better competitor. I mean, some organism, some species of the Brazilian is very better competitor. They have very very. Uh, I mean, they have uh, some defensive mechanism uh, for the predator, and also they really really uh, abundant when they are maybe in the yeah. They can be a uh, alien species. I mean, the invasive too. Because they have a fair, uh, some some region, they have uh, just like mm, yeah, is they have uh, excrete the spatial 
defensive mechanism, maybe the toxin or something like that. Okay, so this why why brazuan is neglected. Uh, at least, at least, yeah, at least. Okay, next. But in fact, we can see in here, but some brazuan are habitat formers. In here is a Celeporaria. In we can see is we can see this picture. This one is a Brazoa, we can see. And we can now, uh, we can, yeah, we can recognize uh, the coral is a good habitat for the, the, the many things of the organism in the fish, maybe the other marine invertebrates, but also, in fact, the, the Brazoa is also the habitat formers too. This one is, uh, it's called Celeporaria, and I found it in the Indonesia. So that's actually they have, uh, they still have the function in ecological, uh, marine ec ecology. Yeah, that's why, yeah, actually it's very uh, uh, good in here to research. Okay, and also uh, not only for the habitat form, some Brazilian, like this one is species from Brazilian, uh, from Brazilian is called a Bucula neritina. It's because they are important as alien marine folding species and source of anti-cancer biochemical. This is one of the species that I uh, told you before, because uh, they have a bit, uh, they are a better competitor because this Bucula neritina, they have a uh, special mechanism, it's called a, a bryostatin in here, they excrete and also they, they, they're excrete to this uh, predator and the predator is just move away. Uh, I, I read the, the article about this, uh, this bryostatin uh, usually uh, excrete in the larva of the bugula neritina. When the fish want to uh, want to eat the larva of the bugula neritina, they excrete this uh, toxic. You mean this? Yeah, we can see this uh, biochemical in there. So the nature, the nature of this uh, function is for the defensive mechanism. Uh, for the human, we we isolate the, this. Uh, compound and we take it and we have it uh, for anti cancer. So this is why uh, actually press one is very uh, actually is very important. That's why I'm interested in this uh, in Chilo. Yeah, maybe Indonesia is a little bit for a researcher about the press one. Yeah, my my difficulties about this press one is yeah is we have to recognize in the field what where is the press one. What is this price one? And, and until now, I, I'm still uh, ever confusing. Uh, when I take, when I took uh, the price one, uh, maybe I recognize, oh, this is price one. But when I took it, it's just a gorgonian or maybe the hydroids. So yeah, it's still, uh, still learning about that. Also, because I uh, someday I, I ask to the bryzoologist, I mean the very expert, from the Brazil one, and they uh, they answer the same. We we cannot identify in the field. It's very very uh, difficult. So uh, the simple way is you just take it. It's okay. you just take it. And if you uh, if you oh this one is not a Brazil one. So yeah, just uh, put it back in the maybe in the field or maybe you can take it in another research for that. So yeah, it's, it's simple way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's from the expert of the bryozoologist. Okay, now we answer to the how about the Brazilian research in Indonesia. So here I put some uh, contribution of the Brazilian research in Indonesia. So in here we can see it's very, very little research of Brazilian in Indonesia. So we can see in here it's a from from uh, 1899 until uh, 90 is a for the Sibuka expedition 
yeah, expedition of the Siboga. If you know the this expedition is very uh, large expedition, the Siboga expedition. They are a collection of Brazilian. I'm sorry, is uh, the I use uh, bahasa. The collection of Brazilian in here. And also in Bali, the Winston and in Hamburg is took the Brazilian. The sample of Brazilian is from uh, Hamburg. Komodo and also this one is from Bali. They put, they took it in there, and you can see this one is very, very long time ago. It's very far from now, and this one is very, yeah, it's a uh, recent uh, research. It's very new research about this, but they take the research about the fossil browser. So it's very interesting in here, and this one is very. Uh, one of the expert biologists in there, uh, Mar Martino et al. is uh, with uh, Paul G. Taylor is a uh, is very famous biologist, and they put they take a fossil brazil and also they have a I have a contribution yeah in I started in two thousand in sixteen two thousand and sixteen and I put in brazil and also the biotechnology because my uh, my major in there. Uh, biotechnology and also i i am uh, interested more interested now about the brazil so it actually this is very potential research when we put the object is the price one very potential because it's very little we know that indonesia we have a very large mega biodiversity yeah we have a large uh, deeper, uh, diversity in there but for the brazil one just just uh, a little about uh, the Brazilian research in there. So this is very potential to do research in Brazilian. So uh, this one is uh, the result of the Martino et al. is the latest uh, uh, research, the fossil Brazilian. It's called Pleurosodomelina javaensis. It's a fossil Brazilian. Uh, when I I read the article they they collected from the uh, East Java, Java team, uh, Java team. So we can see in here is the fossil Brazilian, and they put the name is Pleurosodomelina javaensis, and this is fossil Brazilian. This one, and this is very interesting for me because I uh, I collected in. In Java C, I mean, in the central Java, is uh, the same. Is uh, uh, I mean, a little bit uh, different. And I put this one is Chlorosedelina, Sodonelina. I mean, this one is one species with this fossil Brazilian. So basically, this this uh, <clears throat> this Brazilian is almost uh, uh, live in maybe in long time ago and also until now we take a living brazua because this one is uh, the proof i mean yeah the proof of this uh bra living brazua this one i i yeah i i collected from the chipara and also this one is in species from the brazua uh you can see this is uh if you want uh if you take a look uh Closely, this is almost the same. You can we have this one is autozoid in here. Yeah, we have the azoid in here. And also uh, in my organism, and also almost the same. And what makes uh distinguish Japanese with the Japanese with the Martino et al. Uh, in here and also so when we have a different maybe the morphology in there so we probably uh we have a possible uh, probability to take uh to, to find a new species in there this is the brazilian that i found the para uh the special in the teluk awur okay in teluk awur and if you want to know that i I got this species only there in the cell fragment of uh, bivalves. So 
yeah, I just randomly put the cell fragment and then, oh, this, I think, I think this one is Bryozoan. So I open the lab and also I do the same. And also I just ask to the bryozoologist and the bryozoologist say, this one is a, I think this one is a different with the spiences, with the, the uh, pleurosodonelina, the other pleurosodonelina. Uh, and I think this one is a new species. And when I check it, what is the different? I don't know. And then I, I, yeah, I discuss with the bryozoologist. Yeah. Uh, and also, oh, and for now I know what is different, what makes different with another organism. That's a beauty of the uh, identification, of, especially in the bryozoa. Okay, next is, yeah, this one I would like to, yeah, this one, uh, this uh, research I, I published in this zootaxa is very famous and very common what about the identification and also the new species uh, for the uh, all uh, animals in there not only just uh, marine or not just the terrestrial <clears throat> this one and the review of this article is uh, martino at all so it's very very interesting in there so we have a discussion in there with the reviewer of the zootaxa Okay, so that's a journal. Okay, next is this one is uh, that I found uh, the species of the organism, the bryozoan that I found in the Java Sea. Yeah, uh, we can see in here. I only take, I only collected only six species of a bryozoan, but one of them, I, 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 I found the new species. It's very interesting in there. Maybe we can, if we, take more sample from Indonesian. So maybe we have more probability to have a new species. Why? Because there are still a few of the research in uh, Brazil in Indonesia. So it's very, very potential to research in that. So this one is a research. This is a, uh, the Licornia ferox. Uh, this one is uh, a rack, a Brazilian. They are very, yeah, it's very, we can see it's uncalcified, uh, good uncalcified. And yeah, it's very, if we want, if we put it, if we uh, touch it, it's, maybe it's very fragile, this licornia ferox. Okay, and also this one is, we call it uh, Boricellaria, and also this one is Nutipora. You can see in here, this one is, uh, I want. I would like to see you uh, to inform. This one is autozoid. This one is Afical, Avicularia. So they have uh, the same zoid but different morphology in them. This one is Eleporaria that I found it in the uh, Java Sea in uh, Jepara. It's a Teluk Awur, Karimun Jawa, Karimun Jawa, and also Pulau Panjang, Panjang Island. You can see in Panjang. Maybe from Undip, uh, it's very uh, common in there. This one is a triple zone. It's called a lace coral. Maybe if you know the snack in, in I mean, no, no snack. I mean, the chips from Indonesia is called taro. It's the same uh, shape, the same form with the taro, the snack taro. The same in the, in the, mer in the, in the field. But this one is uh, because uh, Sam is uh, uh, the, the, the form is the, the set is just like this. Okay, so this is the last of my uh, uh, talk about the project of Marine Brazil and research in Indonesia. So maybe I would like to, uh, to inform you a couple of days ago, I have a meeting, international meeting with, uh, with uh, with a bryozoologist from all over the world. Yeah, from over the world is a annually meeting. Uh, it's from the bryozoologists from, yeah, from everywhere in the world. So we have a discussion in there. We have uh, the, yeah, we have a talk about the latest update of the research of the bryozoan. So I learned a lot from that uh, meeting, the online meeting, yeah, the online meeting. 
Okay, so the first thing is the identification and record of the marine region. So because we are in Indonesia and we are still a lack of the research of the region, so we have a potential uh, get a new species. And the two is the molecular identification. We have a lack of data. Uh, I, uh, maybe I would like to show you later, maybe after this uh, slide. Also, the marine organism associated with the region, marine region. This one is a prospect of the marine region research in an ecological perspective. You can see that. And also, the bioactive compounds. We have an example, the very, very uh, famous Brazilian, uh, Bucula Neritina. Maybe if we, we found we found uh, in, in Indonesia, and also we have it in Bali, maybe we can take it and we can isolate the bioactive compound from there, maybe. And also this one is very uh, new. The latest update is the biomineralization of the Brazilian. We know that uh, Brazilian is have a, uh, calcareous skeleton, and also they have uh, they put the contribution in the ocean acidification. This one is yeah, it's a really really interesting to research to do the research of the Brazil one. Especially in Indonesia, we have a tropic, we have a different uh, temperate in in other uh, region. So and we have a very very diverse very diverse for the Brazil. So that's why very, very prospective uh, research from the Brazil one. So this one, I would like to show and uh, the, uh, here is the uh, main in obese. So the, the data, the data of the molecule, I mean, I'm um, sorry, the data for the office is by morphological. I mean, they are just a geographical. They put maybe this one is the hotspot of the biodiversity and also the Indonesia Sea. And this one is, uh, this article is still preprint. Yeah, this one in Bali. Yeah, I read the article. This one. This thing, yeah, the distinct of the data you can see in here is a CO1. Sorry, the orange color of the table is CO1. It's a, but the molecular identification for the uh, marine eukaryotic, I mean eukaryotic organism. Uh, this one is very, uh, we have since only uh, half for this uh, organism. So we have very, very, very urgent for the identity. So because of only this Indonesian Ocean, because another sea or sea, Caribbean sea, the lack of data of the molecular is very, very distinct. I mean, it's very, distinct, very, very far the exact for both. I mean, this one is the platform of the uh, platform of the molecular identification. We have a gene in there, so very lack of data in there. So it's very, very uh, potential to do this. This one, we can see this one. Yeah, uh, in here, I have just take a price one. We only have a small of the species identification of the price one. We can see another uh, organism, another organism, another invertebrate in here. This price one is very small. I think it's smallest, maybe with a uh, platyhelmin test. This one is very difficult. Yeah, it's maybe more difficult than Brazilian because the plant yield mean test very, very uh, small thing in there. But we have a uh, same problem in here, not only Brazilian, but also maybe the maybe the arthropod, annelids, and also the mollusks. They have a big difference data between the morphological uh, data about the, the organism and also the molecular identification for the organism. You can see this one is very, very, uh, uh, very, yeah, very distinct. And here we can see the short data, yeah, short data is the species, of maybe fish, yeah, maybe it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's very high in here, but the highest because, yeah, we can uh, recognize the fish in the 
a fuel in the ocean. But another organism we can see is very, very distinct. It's very lack of the molecular identification, the data of the molecular identification. It's very potential to do that. This one is the last, so this one is ecological perspective. This uh, I, I, I took in, I took uh, Kumar et al. in 2020. So this one is gene expression of bryozoan infected by the parasite tetra capsiloides uh, chrysolomonae mixozoa. So we can see in here, this is one, the bryozoan who has infected by this parasite, parasite from the mixozoa. And this one is the control, not infected. You can see this one is the gene expression when zoid then become they uh, infected, they are infected by this parasite. So this one is very, very potential too, because what is the gene, what is the gene expression that we have to maybe we have to know, maybe we have to identify what is the gene expression. We can uh, have it the uh, information in there. Maybe this one is good. Uh, information, I mean, good, good knowledge for future. So actually, <clears throat> the future result of the of price one is bright. So it's very, very bright, especially in Indonesia. So that's my last talk about my uh, presentation. So thank you very much for the time. And maybe I, I just, uh, maybe over time, so uh, I have, I'm sorry if my uh, my words is are maybe more mistaken, a lot of mistakes. So uh, thank you very much for uh, hear, hearing my presentation, and I uh, back to my to the Dr. Anin. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nijan. And yes, your presentation is uh, very clear, yeah, and very comprehensive. And then the last lectures, please, the ladies. Hi, Dr. Anin. Uh, hello. Uh, Maybe can you hear my voice, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, good evening, Kenneth, and good evening also, Dr. Meza. Nice to meet you all again here. So, um, may I start the presentation right now? Yes, please. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, good evening everyone. And also, good evening to the Dr. Insinyur Suryanti. I saw her in the participant box and also the other lecturer from Department of Aquatic Resources. So, in this occasion, I want to share with you all about the tunicates in Indonesian waters and its associated bacteria. The previous session from Dr. Kenneth uh, always mentioned tunicate in some uh, occasion. So I think this is not a really strange for you to hear about the tunicates. Uh, here, I want to start with what is tunicate and then the classification of tunicate, the diversity of tunicate in Indonesia, and also the potential of its bacteria. So we have two major topics here, the tunicates itself and also the bacteria. Okay, I will start with this. Indonesia is really rich in biodiversity. Also, Dr. Miss then already mentioned that we have a huge mega biodiversity in Indonesia. We have a lot of islands, more than 18,000 islands, the second longest coastline, more than 100,000 kilometers, and also uh, a lot of tropical marine ecosystems, such as estuarial beaches, mangroves, coral reefs, seagrass, and many more. Here I have a short video about underwater life. So let's dive in a little bit, okay?
Yes. Uh, what you already seen is uh, what underwater life in the Maluku coast. Uh, exactly in the last uh, sea. So we did something in that place around three years ago. And what I show you is the, of course, the fish and also a lot of coral reefs there. There's Acropora and there's soft coral and many more invertebrate. If you look closely in there, there is also some polycarpa. One of the tunicate species mostly found in East Indonesia. So uh, invertebrate in marine ecosystem is uh, huge and mostly neglected or lack of uh, consideration, especially in Indonesia itself. Most of the research uh, talk about the coral reef, but they forgot that the coral reef also live with other invertebrates. In this picture, I have two pictures you can see here. This is the hard coral. And this is also the hard coral. And the community here, the small communities, you have sponges here. The, it's formed like the tube, like maybe like annelids, but it's not annelids, with the brown color. And also some of these small things, tiny things like a ball with green and white color. It is tunicates and also this part the blue transparent creature is also tunicate. So I want to show you here that uh, when you visit the underwater life, do diving or snorkeling or skin diving, you are not only see the coral itself, but also the marine invertebrate that mostly uh, not have many consideration on it. And the second picture here, we, are, we are also have Acroporid corals, this is a uh, juvenile, and also this one is Gorgonian. And again, we have another tunicate here, looks like a ball. Uh, the invertebrate itself, they, are, they can live in association with the coral, but they are also can live in solitary way, like uh, in the sandy uh, substrate or etc. In Indonesia, we have, no, in the world, we have more than 2,000 species, and most of them is from the class Acidiaceae or Acidians, and about 72 species of Taliasians and 20 of Appendicularians. Uh, however, the information in Indonesia is still limited uh, to the tunicates itself. Uh, almost the same like Bryozoan, it is also one of the neglected resources. Although the tunicate itself have a lot of advantages. So we talk about tunicate, we have heard about what is tunicate. Tunicate itself is a name. I want to start first from this. Tunicates came from the tunic. Tunic is like clothes for a uh, in our language, uh, you wear tunic with a green color or red colors. Tunic is uh, absolutely the clothes or a mantle in this animal. So it is like a animal with the comfort in the mantle. And this mantle have a lot of color. They have yellow, purple, blue, black, white, and many more because uh, tunic it itself, that has a uh, tunichrome, the cell that contain color. And what it falls in vertebrate. So the previous topic since the metazoan, woody branch, and then bryozoan, most of them is uh, talk about invertebrate. But this time, this topic is uh, completely not invertebrate, but uh, mostly misassuming as invertebrate because if you see like this, and for the first time, you might see it as invertebrate as well because it doesn't have any notochord or anything like backbone. But uh, at the larval stages here, you may see like a tadpole lar larva, but this is the tunicate larva. This is the head and this is the tail. 
the word tunicates or C squared or uro chordates. Uh, it derives from the word uro means tail and the chord uh, means the inner support, rod, group, or chord. However, why it is misassuming as invertebrate because this tail, this chord, is degraded while the tunicate do metamorphosis or adulting. The other name of tunicate is sea squirt because it is squirting water when you touch it. Uh, I have a video of it squirting water, like this one. Look closely. One, two, three, yeah. Okay, it's like trapping the uh, food here, the firing, and then directly to the intestine here. This is the intestine of the uh, Robalaya. Uh, the tunicate, uh, as well as sponges and also bryozoa, they eat by uh, filter feeder. And they live in a solitary or colony. This is the solitary one. And also uh, benthic. The pelagic one is also there, but for another uh, class. Most ACDS class is a uh, benthic organism. Uh, we move to the classification of the tunicates. According to this Ali and Tano Salfi 2016, we have three classification the solitary here colonial and synacidian. The solitary is when the tunicate is only an individual laying on the substrate like uh, maybe rocks or sand or coral reef. And the colonial is when all the zoids are enclosed in a common case and the zoids may or may not connect it with a basal stolon, so like this one. And synacidian is when the genetically identical individuals they are vascularly connected to each other in some way. Each zooid discrete unit has an incurrent and excurrent siphon. So synacidian is different with colonial because colonial have only one colloquial siphon, uh, but synacidian have uh, two bronchial and arterial siphon in their individual or in their zooids. But other guidance book from Michael Page at all in 2019 from New Zealand. Uh, they make more simple way of identification. They only classify this tunicate become two form, the solitary one and the colonial one. This is also colonial. This is also colonial if uh, based on this uh, book. Uh, classification of tunicate itself uh, from the previous literature, we have four classes, appendicularia or larvaceae, acidiaceae, taliaceae, and sorbetaceae. Uh, in this topic, we mostly talk about the acidiaceae because it is the most simple and also the most common tunicate that we found in this world, especially in Indonesia. Uh, so acidiaceae, or we commonly called as acidian, has five orders, aplosobranchia, plebobranchia, stolidobranchia, and teragona, and pleurogona. Uh, unfortunately, from the latest uh, taxonomy, the uh, enteragona and paragona was no longer used. So we only have three, aplosobranchia, plebobranchia, and stolido. Stolidobranchia. So how about in Indonesia? Uh, how is the abundance or diversity of these tunicates? We conducted several surveys since 2017 until 2020 and maybe still continue. From this uh, map, uh, actually, we only did like in the west part of Indonesia, middle part of Indonesia, and the east part. From the west part, we did sampling in Karimun Jawa Islands. We have 11 stations there. And then in the middle part of Indonesia, we have Tulamben, Tulamben Bali. We have like four or six stations and also in the east part of Indonesia, we did sampling in Lhasa Maluku for 
four or seven, four or six station. And most of the uh, tunicates we did initial identification according to the book Coral Reef Animals of the Indo-Pacific by Gosliner et al. 1996. Yeah, it is quite old, but this is like a miracle for us because we rarely find the guidance book for tunicates. Also, this is not a uh, not uh, only in Indonesia, but Indo-Pacific, mostly uh, similar, but some of the sample we could not identify because we because there are not in this book. So it is remain unidentified until now. Most of the tunicate uh, comes from the three orders before, Aplosobranchia, Tebobranchia, and Storidobranchia. Here is some of them, the order Aplosobranchia, Branchia, we have Polycarpa aurata, Clavellina robusta, Clavina molokensis, Didemnum mole, Atriolum robustum, and Aplidium. Uh, the most diverse in color is Polycarpa aurata. We have this is like white and purple and yellow, and then we have fully yellow color and then black color. And I ever found the blue color full purple color because the tunicrum is very uh, diverse in this uh, species. So we have clavellina robusta, robusta means black, so it is formed like a tube with the yellow or white color on the siphon, on the both siphon, so it is called clavellina robusta. And then we have clavellina molokensis, uh, it is also called blue bell tunicates because it is blue and looks like a bell. So it is blue bell tunicates. And this one we have the model. I think this is the most common tunicate if you are diving or do snorkeling in the water in Karimunjo, maybe the closest one, uh, you might commonly see this. It is really big like an orange and the color is green and uh, white. This green color is from the symbion, the prochloron. It functions as a photosynthetic symbion. Similar to this, uh, you will find also this Adrian Robustum. This is also found in Karimun Jawa, but it is also found in other areas in East uh, Indonesia. And then you have this Apidium. Uh, I, I found this, not me actually. Christian found this in Tulamben, but I never saw this in Karimun. Maybe a uh, different geographic has different kind of tunicates. For this, for this polycarpa, we only found this in the middle in Bali and also in East Indonesia. Uh, we never found this in Karimun Jawa. But for this, for Calaverina, we can find it in west and also in east. I think we do not find this in Bali. For this, Didemnum and Atrialum, uh, it is commonly found in east, middle, and also uh, west. Okay, uh, the most order we found is this order, Aplosobranchia, before. I mean, and then the next order is Lepobranchia. This is the more compact than the Aplosobranchia. Uh, but according to the book by Kosliner, <laughs> we could not find the, exactly what is the name of the species. So we just call it Lepobranchia acidian 1, 2, and 3. Maybe we need more molecular approach or molecular work to identify this. Uh, actually, we did it this year, but uh, unfortunately on the database in NCBI, we could not find what we expected. They, in the database, they are only said that this is Acidia, not the name that we expect like that. And this is the most the most advanced species of the tunicate, the order Storidobranchia. Some of the species that we found in this is mostly from Tulamben and from 
is Indonesia. We have Hermania momus, the red tunicates. We have Botryloides here, and also Ausinistella misakiensis. This is really cute for me, like Indonesian flag, but only this red and white. But they have like two two mouths on the left and the red and the middle they have a white spot on it. For the people who might afraid with this kind of tiny and diverse, it might be a bit scary. <laughs> okay, and then why? Why we study about tunicate? Why we should know about tunicate? Because this tunicate have a lot of advantages. Uh, the research of tunicate outside Indonesia is really uh, advanced. We have more data on the natural product, on many things on it. So uh, I resume it here uh, as the food source. This is it kind of a delicious thing right here. This is called sea pineapple. You can search it on Google, sea pineapple. Atau bahasa Indonesianya nanas laut. This is especially Halo Cynthia Roretzi. Uh, it is common in Japan and South Korea. They eat it uh, raw as a sashimi. And then here we have pharmacological source. Uh, if you can see it here, this is Aplidin. This is an anti-cancer drug that uh, used to treat the uh, lung cancer. And then metal accumulator because the tunicate itself contain tunichrome in vanadium side that can accumulate the iron and vanadium. And the last one is bioindicator species because the tunicate itself is benthic and then filter feeder and sedentary. So it can be a bioindicator species. Yeah, this is the most interesting part of the tunicate from all of the advantages. Uh, the source of natural product with various activity. We have antibacterial, anti-tumor or anti-cancer, anti-falling and insecticidal. Antibacterial, we have three antibiotics here, maybe more if we can look further. There is enterocene, octapeptide, and also polycarpamine B. Most of them from didymnum, stella, and also polycarpa. And then for anti-tumor, uh, maybe you may heard about the Yondelis. Yondelis is the anti-tumor from Actina sedian turbinata, and it is the most famous one from the natural product of acidian. And then anti-falling, and also we have insecticidal against uh, malaria, and also Anopheles maculatus and Aedes aegypti. Yeah, this is what I want to show you. This is the most famous product from the Acidian and already in market, already used for treatment of cancer. I show you here three products. Maybe you ever hear them, one of them maybe. Yundelis and then Zepzelka and Apidin. Zundelis is a brand name from Carbetadine, ET743. And it is the treatment for advanced soft tissue sarcoma and also ovarian cancer. This is already a uh, cell in the market by PharmaMar, uh, three of them. All of them is from PharmaMar. And this is first uh, discovered in 1970. And also we have this lurbinectedin or Zepzelka. Both of them are from Actinacidian turbinata, uh, tunicate from the Caribbean Sea, and the last one we have Aplidin. Like the name, it is derived from the tunicate Aplidium albicans. But uh, we have several problems here because the active compound from this, from this acidian, if we directly extract it from it, it is only contain 10 to minus four and the, until 10 to minus five power. So it is really uh, not sustainable and not eco-friendly if we extract it from the environment because it can destroy the tunicates in the nature. So uh, look at 
the compound, uh, the scientist on that ET743 is has the similarity from the structure to the saframicin and saframin, and they did some metaomic approach and found the biosynthetic gene cluster. And then they also do the metagenomic analysis from this whole Actinacidia turbinata and found that this compound is exactly from the endosymbion. What is this? The endosymbion is candidatus endoactinacidia fomentesis or a bacteria. The next example is from Didiamnin B. This is a compound, uh, the antibacterial compound from 3 Didiamnin solidum. And again, uh, based on metagenomic and metaomic approach, it is exactly produced by the associated microbes, Tristrella mobilis and Tristrella bausiensis. That's why uh, we try to bioprospecting the tunicate associated bacteria to discover antimicrobial compounds. Why bacteria? Because the bacteria is more sustainable, less expensive, uh, doesn't take so much space on it. So here are the tunicate associated bacteria. Uh, generally, there are two types of uh, bacteria, unculturable and culturable. The unculturable means that you cannot grow the bacteria in your petri dish in the lab with the standard lab uh, procedure. And the culturable is the bacteria that you can grow in the lab with the standard medium and the standard laboratory procedure. Uh, about 8% natural product in this world is come from the uh, associated microorganisms from the tunicate. But uh, the problem is the most of them are not from the culturable bacteria. So we need uh, other technique, the most advanced technique right now is like metagenomic or metaomic approach. Uh, our finding in 2019 also find a DNA of uncultureable gamma proteobacterium DNA in this kind of species in Hermanimus. And for your information, we have like more than 99% of prokaryotic that not able to culture in the standard laboratory plot protocol. So most of the time, it is unculturable. That's why uh, if you sequence this bacteria, this culturable bacteria, you may find like Vibrio or Fergibacillus, Pseudoalteromonas, only that kind of thing. Maybe you should improve your medium or should improve your technique to uh, culture the bacteria. Uh, yes, this is a little bit complicated. Yeah, maybe the slide. So it is just the culturable tunicate associated bacteria until now that uh, successfully identified from the researcher. Uh, approximately, we in this world successfully identified like 21 genera from all the tunicate associated bacteria. And one of them is this one, Candidatus endoactinacidia, with which in previous slide, I mentioned as the real producer of Yondelis. And this one is some of the genera, like Vibrio, Pseudoalteromonas, Antaya, Halomonas, Salinicola, and Bacillus, as well as Fergibacillus that we found in our research uh, in 2017. And this is one of the bacterium that we are subjected to isolate the antimicrobial compound. The bacterium is Pseudoalteromonas ubra, the KGD22. So this is the appearance of the bacteria. They have a red color in colony here. You may see here really nice and beautiful. And if we conduct gram staining, it looks like this. Uh, it is obviously gram negative because it's red and it has like a basal uh, appearance. And from this, we did mass culture in the liquid medium. Uh, we did extraction and then we did biosegated guided purification. And finally, we successfully isolated the 
pure compound. Here is the compound and the structure, the chemical structure of the compound. It's quite uh, tiny, yeah? it's only 140 something in the mass. And this thing uh, is called isatin here. So isatin is not uh, really new. It's found in 1841 uh, synthetically from indigo. But the new finding here is that it has the activity against the Escherichia uh, coli, the normal strain one, and as well as the uh, multi drug resistant one. Multi drug is the strain that really hard to combat with the normal antibiotic because it already resistant with a lot of antibiotics. So, so the question is why there is study in the in the tunicates? Why there is some uh, cytotox cytotoxic compound there? So our uh, explanation is because the tunicates is sedentary animal. It's benthic animal. It may have a lot of predator there. They cannot run away if there is fish or sea urchin or anything want to eat them. So the bacteria which produce this, which produce, produce isatin, may use this as a weapon because it has a, a high cytotoxicity, cytotoxicity. So it might uh, act as the food deterrent for this tunicate. So it can protect the tunicate from the predator. Uh, the other bacteria, like we found before in the slide, we have like 25 bacteria. So this is still the promising source of antimicrobial compound with the further research on it. And here we have the future prospect here. There are four. The first is lack of acidian taxonomies, especially in Indonesia, and also lack of molecular research on it. So the use of this technique, maybe we can more identify the tunicates and maybe we can find some new species in Indonesia. Because uh, as my experience, uh, we have a lot of sample, but uh, to identify this, we still have some difficulties because from the molecular, molecular approach, we, we, we successfully got the uh, barcoding fragment, but from the database, from the sequence, we, we could not match with the type that we expect. And then the second is a uh, potential source of bioactive compounds. Uh, of course, then it can be such as food supplement for some fishes or other aquaculture biota. And then bioindicator of environmental degradation because it has, uh, it can accumulate vanadium, so it can, have, uh, it can be a bioindicator in environment. And then the last one is the tunic, uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, is made of cellulose, then it is potential to become the biofuels. Of course, by the biotechnological tools that more advanced these days. Okay, I think that's all from me, that's enough. And yeah, I want to acknowledge uh, my partners, the Imam Mohesin, also Christian Waldry, and also Mira Foundation for providing the beautiful image. This is also one of them. The, this is original from them, and they took it while we go to, while we went to the Bali last year. And also this one, if you have any interest in SDN, do not hesitate to contact me. And also this book is our collaboration last year and already published this year, early of this year. And if you are interested in this, so please uh, feel free to contact me as well. Okay, I think enough from me and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amin, for the time. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dia, for your nice talks, yeah. So, all lectures already have the beneficial knowledge today, and we still have around less than 30 minutes for discussions. So if you want 
to direct uh, to ask questions to the speakers directly please write hand but if you want to type yeah you can type in the chat box really. uh, we already have some questions in the chat box maybe i can get it first and wait for someone to open the camera and also the microphone okay uh, i saw jenny sinaga jenny sinaga from itera good evening share this is uh, i think questions for Megan, yeah dr Megan. i want to ask about what are the benefits and disadvantage of the film browser Dr. Mason, maybe you can answer it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So, uh, what's about the disadvantage and the benefit from the phylum browser is uh, I think it's more uh, complex to talk about the benefits and also the, the disadvantage. I mean, when we talk about the benefits, they have a role in the marine ecological marine ecology of the Brazilian. So, I mean, they have uh, something food web for the Brazilian. This is benefit from there. And also for the benefit from the Brazilian, uh, in some regions, uh, they, they can be a bioindicator in there. So, when we talk about the bioindicator, uh, when the Brazilian, uh, they have more I think they have a bad uh, situation. I mean, the condition is just like a, maybe a, another uh, uh, garbage in there, another trash in there. Maybe there are some, uh, uh, there is something that we can know that can be a bioindicator. I think that's a benefit as well. So when we call it about the benefits, yeah, uh, maybe if we do some more research about the price one, we can see, yeah, we can uh, explore more about the uh, of the compounds that's a benefit also. But for the marine uh, ecology, they have, uh, yeah, I think that because a very small uh, phylum, I mean, it's very small organism, but I think, yeah, they, they have, uh, I think they have put uh, the, the what? Uh, they have a special a special function maybe in the uh, in the habitats in the marine that's a benefit and also the disadvantage of the press one i think uh, when we talk about the disadvantage uh, we maybe the we refer to the some organism of the press one so uh, we have to know not uh, all the press one have a disadvantage maybe they have uh, yeah, it's just like a biofooling organism, but there's just some brazoan, and we know that is from a bucula genus, uh, not for the other organism, maybe. So we have to more uh, uh, do the research. They have uh, what is the ecological perspective from this brazoan? I think uh, when we talk about the brazoan, the fossil. That's when uh, that's why that's what uh, we talk about the Brazilian more about the fossil and also the biofooling because in yeah not in Indonesia I think this biofooling I think I uh, I don't know uh, we still don't know about the Brazilian uh, cause the biofooling in Indonesia or we don't know about the Brazilian in Indonesia that's a different uh, approach for that but in other region uh, for example in California. The Pugula Neritina is very falling, very falling organism, very invasive in there. So the uh, crew is very large, uh, a mass in there. And then uh, they, uh, uh, they did the approach by they tried to uh, move away this uh, organism because it's invasive. And also they, they uh, tried to explore what is the pressure, uh, what. Uh, why uh, this uh, organism is very uh, dominant in there, so very invasive in there. So, so 
So that's why they found the bryostatin in the, the in the bugula. So yeah, they take from this uh, falling organism, but they have a uh, benefit from this bio falling organism. So that's uh, maybe we talk about the bryozoa. Maybe maybe in the in other specific we uh, maybe we have to do some research for the, for the specific organism. That's I. Yeah, that's I cover. That's I answer for this question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mejan. I hope it's <clears throat> clear for Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, may, may I add something? Okay. Yes, please. Just, just some <laughs> aspects of the benefits of browser. Uh, they're, they're part of the biodiversity. So, yes. with the high biodiversity, is resilient. Resilient, yes. Resilient from, from human impact, and you get more what they call ecosystem services from such an ecosystem. So that's on that level, uh, the bryozoans has many species. Um, so they may they're part of the, the diversity, and that is important yes. for a stable system. Um, also, when we talk about biofouling, mm -hmm. um, a big problem with, with, with the ship transport around the world is that you have uh, fouling as, uh, organisms sitting on the, the ship hull and so it, the, the ship goes much much slower it takes more fuel to, to go because of the <laughs> drag of the water and that is often uh, acorns these cirripedes but actually very often studies have shown that it starts with these sea mats membranipura bryozoans so it's mm -hmm. bryozoans sits there first and then other fouling organisms sits on top of the bryozoans but you can't see it so it's it, it's very relevant in that respect but maybe also overlooked because you, you see the larger um biofouling biofouling organisms mm, okay so uh bryozoa are also biofolders yeah yeah for us, for us humans, so I think they, they just they just use empty space. If there is some empty space anywhere, and then the ship hull, of course, loads of empty space coming. Mm -hmm. The larva sits on it because okay, there's a yes. strong selection for use any kind of uh, available space, and then they have these toxins to keep all the other out. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Next questions come from my college to Dr. Kenneth that uh, they just chat me, not in the chat book, chat book, I mean. Okay, uh, for Dr. Kenneth, uh, she's curious in the, in the food of analytes. I mean, they, they are they omnivores or maybe some of herbivores? Could you please tell us more about it? What, 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 what animal group? Uh, can you say it again? Yeah. Analytes. Analytes. Some of analytes. Analyze. Analyze. Mm -hmm. Say it again. I don't know what, what group is that. Analyze. 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 Uh, sorry. Yo. I'm sorry. To... No, the, 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 ba the basal analytes are predatory. They, they are. They are. Um, Basically, the 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 the, um, the oldest annelids were probably uh, predators, oh, actually, and then okay. then the sedentary, um, the secondarily uh, developed annelids have become uh, they're deposit feeders. So there's no annelids, very few that they're not that eat, they don't eat plants. They more the the filter feeders or mm -hmm. predatory. Um, and then you have, um, they are so extreme, extremely diverse. Maybe you have heard of the fire worms. They mm -hmm. can live in the, this deep water, um, uh, these this, this, uh, warm, warm vents on the ocean floor, volcanic areas, so this hot water coming up on the, on the crust. And they're just... Very, very close to this uh, ho overheated 400 degrees Celsius water, just centimeters away from it. They have these fireworms and they are feeding on bacteria. 
or they have bacteria in the body this actually feeds on on uh, on uh, on the, the chemical reactions but then on the other hand you have the ice worms on, on the deep uh, several kilometers deep uh, um, big abyssal plains of the, the most of the world actually they have this methane ice kind of ice uh, this uh, uh, water with methane uh, molecules and that actually is, is worm making burrows in the methane ice and also they have this symbiotic uh, bacteria in the body so who, who can kind of oxidize methane so uh, they're, they're, they're widely different in all aspects okay. yeah so mostly they are predatory yeah, yeah i say basically basically they are predatory yes okay most and most yeah, you say and next question this is come from me i'm curious about the crustacean the amphipod yeah that uh, have some connection or uh, with the jellyfish hyperia yeah. galba yeah 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 is there any symbiosis like um, zoocentel with the coral i mean uh, is there any symbiosis between the amphipod with the jellyfish no in, in that case it's more like the the, the... Of course, they, they have a relationship. Of course, they are they are predatory on the jellyfish sitting inside mm -hmm. the, the the gut uh, folds, um, but they don't feed too much. They don't kill. They are, they, are, uh, they don't kill the the. Otherwise, they will lose the food. So they eat. Okay, a bit of it, and they eat slowly, but not too much. And sometimes even you can see in ten or four ounces. Small ten of just one Hyperia galba uh, jellyfish amphipod, just one in each, just one, mm. just a single one, not more than that. So of course they have some kind of uh, self-regulatory effect. Okay. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they, um, so they they not they are not directly. Oh, there's a predator prey balance more than and that it's a kind of symbiotic relationship in a way yes but they are not dependent of course the, the i guess the, the the jellyfish would be very happy to get rid of the the, the amphipods feeding on it from the inside but <laughs> it would be better without them and it's not the way around of course the the amphipods must have some food okay but otherwise also that they, they may control uh, the population of, of the jellyfish you don't get too much jellyfish so mm. that could also be a kind of a mechanism an ecological balance in the in, yeah. in, in a dynamic balance thank you for the answer and um, anyone want to ask the question directly to the speakers maybe Please raise hand so you can know and notice that you want to ask. Otherwise, I could add something else. Mm -hmm. One of the themes for 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 uh, Mesan and Dia and, and I was touching on that a bit this because of the cytotoxin entry microbial anti-fungi toxins that you are looking for um, from bacteria or uh, because something that should be mentioned though you also have it in algae uh, they have just uh, found that in uh, uh, brown algae that's something called fucoidin uh, that is cytotoxic also <laughs> mm. um, actually it, it, it's called age-related um, um, and you go blind in the in the, the blind spot in the in the, in the retina. Uh, oh. okay. Uh, okay, there's a problem with the the, 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 the vessels of blood grows in between the rods. Uh, so we, it, it's actually the most common uh, cause of, of blindness for people like me over 80. Uh, 
over 50 years old. <laughs> 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 the, 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 the most common uh, cause for blindness. And there was no cure until oh. just three years ago, a Dutch woman uh, mm -hmm. discovered by mistake as some of these, these big discoveries are often made. If you remember the penicillin, the, how they discovered yes. penicillin on agar yes. uh, So she made some mistake in the lab and found that fucoidin actually yes. uh, stopped the blood vessels from, from growing. So they can see uh, actually it helps. Uh, oh. on, and they get this from brown algae, fucoidin. Mm. So now there is a cure for this kind of blindness. As at least at least you can you can kind of you can kind of stop stop the, the, the development of the disease so it takes a longer time. So all this all these organisms that are living in the sea um, they have these toxins to defend themselves against against being grazed. Um, maybe I don't know if the predators it could also be against bacterial infection or fungi because you have even even it's the sea they still have these bacteria as you know bacteria and fungi so maybe that's the main agent the, the, the most important thing they want to fend off rather than some that are chewing on them and maybe there's a big variety because there are so many species and there's such a vast network of 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 of, of uh, organisms that are, are, that are <laughs> they have these di di different things um, so maybe we have all, all this entire scale but if you sit still uh, in the water you need to be toxic it seems like a uh, so, what, what, it's more like, more like a law. If if if, if something is there uh, and, and if it's not already eaten, it must be so toxic in some way, and there should be some. You still have to locate the okay. the substance. Yes, yes. Oh, and, okay. oh, and if, when you, and if you look at all these species we don't know yet, they're not being described of tunicates, of bryozoans, of everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's so much more to find, especially now today, when we have this big problem of um, of resistant bacteria, bacteria. Uh, bacteria getting resistant against and antibiotics. antibiotics yes. It's a, it's an enormous problem. Yes. Suddenly, we might stand there without any protection for common diseases. Common diseases yes. So th that's why this is very very urgent. Okay. Yeah, I think it is nice discovery from the Dutch, yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question from the chat box. Or maybe uh, someone who want to deliver or... Uh, I think there is question from Zakia Rahim. Oh, yeah. Zakia. Zakia. Ask to Mr. Mason, and Mrs. Dia. Maybe uh, Dr. Kenneth also uh, wants to add um, input. That was an interesting topic. Uh, I agree that research on bryozoan and tunicates in Indonesia is still uncommon and very rare. Okay. And especially about the diversity. So I wonder what is the specific morphological characteristic of bryozoan and tunicates that we can see and determine directly. And if you want to know what the species is by using molecular identification, is there any primer that specific on bryozoan and tunicates DNA target? And what body part that supporting on DNA expression? Thanks in turn. Okay, maybe thank you for the uh, question. Maybe uh, Dr. Dia can answer first because uh, Dr. Dia, uh, yeah, yeah, they, she actually did this uh, identification, okay. molecular, molecular identification. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mason. Okay, I will try to answer the question from uh, Mr. or Mrs. Zakia Rahim. I'm sorry if uh, Mr. Ken. 
So the first question is the I wonder what is the specific morphological characteristic of Brazil and tunicates. For the tunicates itself, the morphological appearance. Uh, for me, uh, I also a beginner. Uh, I'm still learning how to identify this uh, biota, this tunicate. I mean, uh, first thing I look from this tunicate is for sure this body form. It is solitary or it is colonial, and then I look in the how it the shape. It is ball or is this arch or it is like a uh, encrusting like the sponges or just a uh, like the tube. And then I look on the color because the color also can identify the tunicates like the digamid, they always green. But some of the genera like atrium are also green. So to differentiate between didymnum and the atrium, Triolum, we look at the atrial siphon, they have like hole. How is the hole is shaping? Like uh, it is uh, circular or anything else. That's uh, as long as I know about the morphological. Maybe uh, Dr. Kenneth can edit after this. <laughs> and then for the, for the molecular approach, actually we did it uh, maybe three years ago at 2018. Uh, we did it with the extraction of the tunicate. We extract the mantel because we, we also have no idea what to extract from the body part. Is it the gut or the tunic or the rhizome? We, we have no idea because we could not find any publication. Is it yet? And we try to extract from the tunic. Uh, some of them are success, some of them are failed. We have a lot of contaminants. The DNA are not pure from the tunic until then. In this year, I found a publication that they said the most potential part or the most clean part to do extraction of the DNA is the siphon. The siphon is the upper part near the mouth of the tunicate. That's the best part to do extraction based on the uh, reference. And then for the primer, initially we use the universal primer for infected with C01 and HC01. You can find it freely in the internet in some publication they use it and they work but unfortunately for our sample it did not work uh, <laughs> we don't know why at that time why this is not working and then we search for other publication and finally we found a specific primer for this tunicate from Stefania at all 2009 and we tried to use them and yeah, we successfully identified the uh, tunicate at that time. We uh, successfully identified Polycarpa aurata with some uh, different variation. They have a lot of colors. They have blue, they have yellow, white, and anything else like black and white. Maybe they have genetic variation inside the species, but we need further uh, genomic things in that place. For, oh yeah, uh, one more thing for the extraction of the DNA from tunicate. It is not as easy as if we extract the DNA from bacteria. The bacteria is really easy. We can use uh, heat and chillax. We use it and it is can uh, produce the target DNA. But for the uh, tunicates, the obstacle is this mantle is contained of cellulose. And uh, the inner part is full of bacteria because it is filter feeder. And if we extract from the mantle, it is really uh, like, what is it called? Not a jelly. Jelly is more smooth. Maybe something like coconut, but coconut, old coconut, something like that. So it's, it's not dissolved in the buffer and it's still keep like the coconut all the time like uh, I use it like um, 
put the proteinase K to the buffer and leave it overnight in the heat, but it's still like that in the morning. So we decided to, okay, we may run this as this because it is really hard to dissolve in the buffer, but unfortunately we are uh, not lucky we don't get the band. So, what, yeah. what, usually, what, what are you using for to, to uh, dissolve the tissue? A quick extract is one? Yes, yes, we have uh. tissue, Zemo tissue kit DNA extraction. Okay. Hmm? Yes. Maybe we need more pre-treatment before that or anything. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, chance in this part, in this uh, extraction method. Maybe we can develop some new method or anything else in this. Yeah. Okay. That's from me, I think. Thank you, Dr. Anin. What about DNA from, from, from the bryozoans, Ms. Han? Do you have you any uh, experience? I have never tried um, that. Yes. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too, uh, Mr. Kenneth. I have not tried about uh, the DNA, the molecular identification. Uh, the, yeah, I think uh, the... I think uh, when I uh, read, uh, I read the publication about the, uh, yeah, I think uh, molecular identification of the Brazil, they just use one is the universal database, uh, but actually the problem is uh, we don't have any data of the species. I mean the the uh -huh, sequence okay. of the of the data of this species that's the problem of the prayer zone so when i uh attend i join in this uh, association i mean the this uh, meeting uh, a couple of ago they need a more prayer zone sample to collect and also they need uh, to do some barcoding of the prayer zone that's uh the homework of us for the prayer zone so actually uh if we just have uh, the big data of the Brazilian, we can use the CO1. But yeah, the problem is we don't have the, any specific or the sequence of the DNA here. And uh, we try, uh, not me, but I read the article, they miss uh, distinguish. I mean, yeah, uh, they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot uh, recognize what is this, is this is a Brazilian or this is the the another organism so that's the problem for the uh the data so basically we don't have a uh, code of the person uh, 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 huh? mm -hmm. yes yes that's the problem that's certainly yeah, it's different library so maybe this uh mr zakia rahim want to know what the first uh the person i have a paper so i can share with you because i am not uh good in the yeah make a primer or something like that i, I have a good in that so because yeah i, I think i will uh, uh maybe i will send my uh, sample to the my college my bryozoologist with the molecular identification because there's uh, for now the homework of the person is that so yeah we still uh, make a library uh, just like mr cannot say we have to make a big data for them. That's for the molecular identification, but the morphological, as I said before in this talk, uh, if we want to take a specific characteristic, I mean, the of the morphological, we have to do the same uh, scanning electron microscope. And then we have uh, the specific morphological for the zoan. But this is my opinion when I go to field, when how to, uh, I recognize, the brazoan, they have a unique pattern in the brazoan uh, because the zoid, I mean, the zoid have the colonial organism, they make a unique pattern. I mean, uh, maybe in the erect uh, organism, erect brazoan, and also the encrusting, they have a pattern. So this is uh, because, uh, yeah, the problem is very small. So we have to really, really uh, closely to look this. Uh, pattern when we yeah when we when i go to field so i just put under the raw and then the see oh they have uh, maybe the encrusting but maybe just a plate the plan the plane uh encrusting oh so this is not very well but when you just put 
a rock or maybe the cell uh, uh, fragment. Uh, yeah, the cell fragment of the bivalve. And then they have a pattern. Uh, that's a po possibility they have. The, they are uh, the bryozoa, I think. But yeah, still, yeah, the bryozoologists also say it's a very difficult in the field. Yeah, I'm as a newbie, so yeah, as I, said, I just follow the bryozoologists. So we have to collect all of the sample, I think. Yeah, whether it's wrong or not, it's, it's okay, I think, for that. Thank you for the question. Maybe you cannot uh, maybe add something or maybe give something, give an explanation for the morphological present or something, if you have any experience to find the present in the field, maybe? Uh, to do it in the field, I, I, you can see the, 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 either the mats with these special specific patterns or you have the erect colonies. Yes. Um, but I think that's something you have to learn Yes. To, to detect, okay, that looks like a, a, a bryo so on. Yes. This is very small. You, it's, it's hard very to small, see yes. the field. Oh? Yes. 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to collect this as some kind of bryo so on. You bring it to the lab and you look closely. Then you can see what what's, you can only identify it under a stereo microscope, I think. Yes. Really yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I agree with Mr. Kenneth. So, yeah. yeah, take your sample to the lab. Yes, that's the point. <laughs> so, okay, thank you uh, for the question. Okay, I think uh, most of the marine invertebrates, maybe we can start with the primer TO1, yeah? Yes, yeah, yes. Start with that, yeah. And yes. TO1. And yes, TO1. The problem. Yeah, make the optimization first for the extra DNA extraction. Then we can go yes. to the amplification. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think because we are running out of time, we are very sorry to all the participants. Yeah. We cannot read all of the. I'm questions. sorry, Mr. Tukrani. Yeah, because we are now running out of time. Now is 10 to okay. 10 more, yeah? So for everyone who want to ask more questions, you can text the committee uh, by Gmail or um, something else, or contact the speakers directly, because uh, the previous we already uh, explained to you the Gmail or the email for the speakers. So maybe uh, I want to summarize this guest lecture for today from the first lecture. We have uh, several conclusions. The first, Lopotrocozoa is member from Bilum Analytes, which have several classes like Polychaete, Tritelet, uh, and then Crustacean. Several uh, have several classes that there are copepod, the tecostraca, malacostraca, with some orders like ambipod, uh, stomatopod, and decapod. And the third conclusion, pilum echinodermata consists of crinoidea, asteroidea, echinoidea, and also hollow turoidea or teripang, yeah. <laughs> From the second lecture, uh, we have several highlights because the first, the bryozoan is sessile colony and filter feeder organism. And then bryozoan is everywhere in the sea, some found in the deep sea, hot substrate, bathing organism, and so on. And the third, the prospect for bryozoan research in Indonesia is very promising, yeah. So for everyone, we encourage you to do collaboration research later, maybe. And from the third session, tunicate is benthic, filter feeder, some living solitary and colony. There are five orders from class Assisbicea, such as Aplousobrancia, Pebobrancia, Stolidobrancia, Enterogona, and Pleurogona. 
and the advantages of unikids are a food source and then pharmacological source, metal accumulator, and bioindicator species. I think that's all for the lectures today. Uh, sorry for maybe uh, I made some mistakes during this uh, first lecture. And thank you very much for all the lecturers who give very insightful knowledge for us. And yeah, we can give it back to the host, MC, Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Anin. Um, okay, so everyone, so that was the lecture for today. Okay, so it's very informative and it's really important knowledge for all of us, okay? So, okay, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we get to the last session in this event, which is the closing session. And let's close this event by saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. As the host, thanks to Associate Professor Kenneth, also Dr. Mizan, also Dr. Dia as our speakers, and also Dr. Aninitia as the moderator for the first session. And this is the second session, which is the last session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anin, for moder for letting for let the this seminar. Uh, oh, this world class professor event. I mean. <laughs> Also for Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology, Republic Indonesia. Also thanks to LPDP, which is Indonesia Endowment Fund for Education for funding. As well as we appreciate for all the participants who attend this event from the series one uh, until this uh, second series. The certificate will be delivered to your email. So please don't forget to fill the attendance form in the chat box. Uh, you can see the link in the chat box uh, for all the participants. You can fill the absence. Yes, for the absence a link. We would, also into, we would also like to invite you to follow and subscribe our social media for updating uh, for the next online seminar. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is the our, uh, this is our social media for Instagram, YouTube, also uh, the web and Gmail. Yes. In case you don't receive your certificate for this seminar, you can reach the committee via email. Uh, in the bill, in the last one, you can read this is dsda dot f f p i k undip at gmail .com. And also, I apologize if in guiding this event, I made mistakes or offend someone here. And thank you very much for the attention, everyone. So yeah, I am Amanda as your master of ceremony or maybe as a host for today. Um, I'm standing back. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, bye. thank you, Gunet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry, yeah, for yeah, maybe Bye, thank a bit you. late oh, for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, see you down. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. See you thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.